Ooh, already interesting. Ooh, fancy editing. Why would I be so fucking difficult? I was told to be a nice guy. I was told to be a gentleman. I did everything right. Oh no, is that Myron's voice already? Ooh. Why did she still leave me? And we all started to figure out, whoa, everything I was told was a lie. Y'all are watching me right now because everything you were told was a lie. Imagine one day you're sitting in Paris, you're sitting there having a fucking coffee, and terrorists roll through with AKs, and the person next to you has their brains blown out. You're gonna stand there like, waiting to die, like motherfucker. I'm gonna be like, bang, oh, seen that before. Okay, boom, boom duck and dive in, take one terrorist out, next, get the AK, go Rambo, take out all the fucking Pakistanis. They're reviewing him. Yo, this editing's so good already. Bro. This, whoa. 180 page manifesto reportedly written by the shooter where he describes his perceptions about the dwindling size of the white population. So if you guys decided that you weren't gonna sleep with a bunch of chads who were gonna use you, there wouldn't be chads that were using you guys. You know what I mean? But the problem is, is that women want to sleep with chads who end up using them. <laughs> Yo. That was good. On May 27th, 2022, I posted a video called Dissecting the yep, Manosphere. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. It was 90 minutes long, and believe it or not, it was supposed to be longer, but the deadlines and technical difficulties mm. that I had at the time forced me to bring it out in parts. Because I had to separate yep, time yep. in between each video, each video got longer until at the end of the whole project, I had six hours worth of talking about the Manosphere. Yep. My graduate studies had engaged with the Manosphere, Red Pill, Incel world, and I felt like I had some pretty good and unique things to share on the topic. And I still kind of didn't want to do it. Despite that, I had a ton of people since then reach out to tell me that these videos helped them and changed the way they looked at the world of themselves. And it's amazing Great. to hear that and to know that I could make something that helps people and affects the world in a positive way. Mm. Also, that first video has made me about $10,000 as a time of mm, 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 mm. We love to hear it, girl. Now, I would make videos for free if I had to. I literally did for about a year and a half. And I have been helping young boys and men since I was a young man myself as a mentor, a teacher, a social worker, two professions that are not known for paying well. So it's never been about the money when it comes to stuff like this. The second video, Connecting the Manosphere, has also made me a little over $10,000 since Let's 2020. Go. The third Let's go. video, Understanding the Black Manosphere, has only made me about $5,000 because it got demonetized after a few months. Damn. I believe because I called Kevin Samuels a <laughs> which he is. He was a secret Trump voter. Go watch the video for details. So aside from all the help that those videos provided for a lot of people, it also definitely helped me. And, you know, kind of revealed a pattern that I think was interesting to engage with. But more than that, I'm not the only person to make Manus related content or make money off of it. In fact, the most profitable creator of Manus related content probably in the last couple of years is one Andrew Tate. Between 2022 and 2023, Andrew Tate emerged as the undisputed king of the Manosphere. Ironically, while never actually being in charge of a single social media platform for the most part, instead, mm -hmm. through a pretty ingenious scheme, Tate created an online course called Hustlers University. Mm -hmm. And through this course, thousands of other channels on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter began mm -hmm. to share any content he was connected to. All he had to do was go on the countless Red Pill podcast and do interviews and let his Ugh, army of Look at that fashion decision on Tate's part. Look at this open shirt pattern tattoo. What is this decision? Go on the countless Red Pill podcast. Look at this outfit choice. Look at this. Man, that's so tight. I can see his nipples, man. And do interviews and let his army of bots, literal and figuratively speaking, mm. do the work for him. Via the subscriptions to Hustle University, Tate was said to be making millions of dollars a month, though it's hard to pin down actual numbers. Damn. And all this money was coming from mostly young men and boys drawn in by his lavish lifestyle, charismatic personality, and willingness to take advantage of their insecurities with the promise of helping them become financially independent. Idly, despite what I just described to you, this is probably the most honest thing that Tate has done to make money since he was a kickboxer. It's fun and good to shit on Andrew Tate, but yes. I've been thinking a lot about his role and my role. Oh. 
in this whole content creation equation. In many ways, we have the same job. No slurs in the chat, guys. Try not to slur. Oops, you will mess. See, you will see what happens. You'll mess up my relationship with YouTube. No slurs in the chat. I'll have to, I'll mute you. No slurs in the chat. Job description. Well, I, of course, have very different goals in mind and very different content overall. At the end of the day, my target audience and the strategies I use to reach it are the same as Tate's. Our product is different, but the genre is the same. Oh, this occurred to me after watching a video from the editor of this video, Zatzman. Zatzman, a smaller creator with a genuine interest in the manosphere and related self-help content, had this epiphany that regardless of his role in debunking manosphere content, he was still a part of a larger apparatus that didn't seem to have a beginning or an end. And even as he was doing good work and making good content, it was still serving that bigger function at the end of the day and worked against his attentions and goals and just desire to be creative. A little bit of an element of, you know, utility of it because i mean we live in an age where everyone has access to a smartphone and the internet and mm -hmm. everybody can post their opinions everywhere at any time about everything it's a little bit frustrating at times when you see yo what's happening in this background am i seeing is that dragon ball z i'm seeing is that anime i'm seeing or is that just different animation am i recognizing things correctly mm. or is that not is that not anime i can't tell the kinds of things that get popular and like while i can understand and emphasize why those things become popular at the same time part of me is just like okay people are ridiculous and like it feels like you're fighting this endless fight against like human ignorance and stupidity you know i value like good genuine criticism like good analysis and good critique as like art generally helps you understand yourself how you relate to the world but with this manosphere content i was just like there's not that much to really glean from it once you understand sort of like the basic mm -hmm. principles and like how to interact socially how to carry yourself simple basic dating advice it doesn't matter if it's through an app or in person etc cetera, etc cetera. like the, the the general principles you know i'll say this i think the the hustler bubble is sort of similar to the menosphere bubble the financial bubble takes the same script. Every content creator in the hustle, like financial bubble, basically gives the same advice in a different package, sort of like the red pill. So there's like a script. I think about doing that sometimes. And every bubble has it, by the way. It's so when you build an audience, the same audience watches all the people. Like I, I like all those bubbles. Well, I don't like the Menosphere bubble. I just watch it so I'm up to date. It's exhausting. I don't watch it often. But the finance bubble or the hustle bubble, I watch a lot of their content, like all the podcasts and everything that everyone, like I watch them and they all say the same stuff. It's just the slight variation does allow for me to gather new tools. So what I'm listening for is not the basic script that's always the same, you know, um, save your money, high and high yield savings account, like high, you know, like all this stuff, you the buzzwords you always hear. It's not that stuff I'm listening for. I'm listening for the one in a, you know, thousand listen that someone says something that goes, oh, and it like clicks in my brain and gives me an epiphany. And that's what I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, duh. It's like when you watch The Panelists, everyone's kind of arguing and we're all just kind of doing our things or whatever. But when someone says something that just hits you the right way, you're like, oh, fuck, that's what I was waiting to listen to. I think Menosphere is the same, where they follow the same cookie cutter script. They just change the flavor. So Andrew Tate and Myron are very different presenters saying the, kind of the same thing. But it's like, okay, which audience, like who's which best? And then what audience overlaps between the two of them? And I guess same with essay YouTubers, like video essay YouTubers. There's the same vibe, like you're expecting the same vibe, but then the way they present it allows you to consume the information. Like I prefer FD Signifier over every video essayist basically that I watch on YouTube. Um, him and Kidology are the two people that I watch the most uh, in comparison to anybody else who does video essays. I don't know why. I just gravitate towards them the most. I can't tell if I just... I don't know what it is. I just seem to enjoy them the most. It's probably, I think they're probably, well, I think I probably watch Z because she covers things I'm interested in and I want her perspective specifically. And I think I like FD because I find him to be very secure in his opinion, but also pretty fair and like often very nuanced. But obviously, like I know he's moving towards a certain direction. Mm, that's interesting. I should ponder why I like them the best.
Hmm. Who's your favorite video essays, guys? I'm trying to remember if I'm forgetting people's names, maybe. But I think they're the two that I watch the most. Stay relatively the same. There's an information threshold to this. And it feels like you're in a hot tub and you're just like in the hot tub, like with all the fluids and everything. It's just like constantly like mishing and mashing like over and over again. And eventually yeah. you, you prune up and you're like, OK, I got to get out of the hot tub. I think that's a good analogy. Nice. That's an excellent analogy. <laughs> that's an excellent analogy. That bit is definitely getting in the video. This is an interesting and not overly discussed part of the whole Manosphere discourse. I don't think enough people have stopped to ask how and why the Manosphere, Red Pill, MGTOW, Incel, and whatever communities work not just as social groups and mm. social problems to be addressed, mm -hmm. but also as a valuable economic engine for content mm. creation and the ramifications of what that means. Ooh. There's always talk about combating the manosphere. And if I'm honest, I've never felt like framing it as a battle between two groups and online content creation Ooh. made much sense. Instead, we're going to look at the manosphere as a manifestation of bigger forces than anything we do here on YouTube or this is so interesting because it's true. So much of our reaction content, I mean, heck, this whole video essay is only possible because there was a manosphere to comment on. So it almost, almost makes you wonder, like, what's the relationship we're all having with each other? You know what I mean? That's why there is sort of this statement from some people, like certain people I will not engage with because I'm like, I don't want to associate with you. But then I also understand, like, you know, how hard is that? Like, is that a strong value or is that just like a preference? Like, I don't want to have to deal with you unless I really have to. But also like, oh my gosh, like I do love watching reaction content to the red pill. I do. I love it. It's just I would love to hear other people's opinions about the things I'm also like in conflict with. Or any other social media platform. And we're going to look at those forces in this bigger system and critique how all of us function in that system in order to find more efficient solutions or at least something new and interesting to say about this problem. Mm. So, yeah, there won't be a whole lot of dunks and debunks in this one. But it's still going to be a fun, informative ride. It's go. also going to go a lot of, a lot of, lot of places. Let's go. Exciting. We still don't really understand the manosphere. It's likely that if you're watching this, that you've already watched my other anti-manosphere content. But I still want to review some of those core themes and add to them because even after six hours worth of talking about this subject, mm. there's still plenty of stuff that got left out. Mm -hmm. So in this section, I want to fix that. For instance, so many people see the manosphere as a modern phenomenon when really the only modern aspect of the manosphere is social media. The ideals mm -hmm. and themes and aesthetics that we see in the manosphere today are not new. 15 or so years ago, you had Tucker Max books, Mystery, oh, yeah. the pickup artist, The Man Show. And those are just the ubiquitous elements that broke into the mainstream. These shows and books were anti-feminist and misogynistic, but a bit less overtly hateful toward women compared to their modern counterparts. Mm. But the framework and the ideology is still there. It's probably hard to imagine, but Manosphere pro-man rhetoric doesn't always start with misogyny and women hating. But it does inevitably end with that, unfortunately. Since the 1970s, there have been various consortiums and coalitions of men coming together to uplift men. The mythopoetic men's movement of the 1990s is where we get the concept of toxic masculinity, for example. We often see that term as something that came from feminist movements, but it was actually men who recognized the problems hmm. of compulsory and traditional. Ooh, I didn't know that. You know, male gender roles and combined it with some understanding of feminist theory to come up with something to explain that problem. One of the earliest modern bastions of a manosphere comes in the form of the men's liberation movement. And for mm. a time, it was a very progressive, almost feminist entity with an ideology that sounds more like soy boy stuff that me and foreign men and Noah Samson talk about today. Men's liberation discourse walked a tightrope from the very beginning. First, movement leaders acknowledged that sexism had been a problem for women and mm. that feminism was a necessary social movement to address gender inequities. But they also stressed the equal importance of the high costs of the male sex role to men's health, emotional lives, and relationships. 
In short, they attempted to attract men to feminism by constructing a discourse that stressed how the male role was impoverished, unhealthy, and even lethal for men. But there was eventually a schism among this group and various others, resulting basically in a split between the pro-feminist men's movement and the anti-feminist man's movement. And at the core of this split is basically what the modern manosphere is today. Both groups agree that traditional male roles in the reality of men is a problem. The pro-feminist group sees that as an issue of patriarchy and capitalism and things that if you understand real sociological phenomenon, make a lot of sense. Men cannot play traditional roles because the tools to play those roles are denied to them by various systems such as capitalism, etc. The anti-feminist group, however, sees the blame for this problem as a result of women and feminist movements throwing off the natural way of things. And this argument is obviously one that is often repeated today by mm-hmm. right wing and reactionary voices. Mm-hmm. And of course, this isn't true when you hear people complain. About- I just like that everyone who's the argument that it's natural and in nature and the way things are supposed to be in all and in everyone's arguments. And like, what if everything is just natural? What if that's my theory? My theory is humans are part of nature. Therefore, anything that humans do is natural, right? We have this arrogant part of our brain that makes us think we're making choices that are outside of nature. And we have no evidence for that. Like you have no evidence that you are making any choice outside of nature itself, not the micro choice of like, what should I eat today? I agree. Like when we say things like go above your nature, it's not real. It's it, I agree. I use that too. But it's not actually true. It's not you're you're not actually going above your nature because making the choice is to go within your nature because your nature is to be able to make the choice. So like you can't actually rise above your nature. The reason I say that is because in the bubble I was raised in, when you said go above your nature, it's go above the thing that's tempting you that you think is just you know, oh, default settings natural to you. I really want to, I really want to touch myself to porn and oh my gosh, I can't because it's a sin and the Catholic church says it's a sin. So I have to go above my nature and not do this thing. Like, but even going above your nature, you're still acting within your your nature because you can't escape it. Can a bear act outside of his nature? Like our nature is what we are. Does a tornado act outside of its nature? Does a tree act outside of its nature? Does the ocean act? No, like we are nature. So again, everything that we do is within our nature, but we create this wording that says, oh, you can go outside of your nature. No, you can't. What evidence, what scientific or some sort of evidence do you have that you can do something other than what you're going to do? You know what I mean? Like your nature is yourself, you know? Tom Fullery in the chat says it's natural for us to socialize each other, but we can call socialization unnatural. Yeah, I agree that you can call it that. I think at the root of what we're dealing with in terms of using biology as an uh, explanation for why people do things, I don't think you can escape your biology. You know what I mean? So I do think ultimately it's if it's natural for women to date this way or men to do it this way, like it's all natural. Everything we're doing is natural. It's all within nature. You know what I mean? Crazy says nature as in the environment you were raised in could be. So that is talking about action as being perceived. So when the red pillars say it's natural for women to want certain kinds of men, they're really saying it's natural within the socialization of this bubble, but everything also within the socialization of the bubble is a part of your biological nature because you can't escape it. You know, MMM says, what would you call a bear on a tricycle? I would say a bear acting as a bear. Anything you're capable of is still within your nature. I don't think, again, nature meaning the root of your biology, not the ability to make choice does not defy the reality that you are a biological creature in an environment, like you are a part of the ecosystem. So I think at the root of it, we are all acting within nature no matter what we do. But socially, we use words like in your nature to explain sort of something that is above our biology, but like you're always just your biology. Because like as a fundamental, like you cannot be outside of it. You cannot exist. Your consciousness does not exist outside of your body or your perception. But in conversation, we say environment to react to the idea of choice being made, right? De Freak says that's the conflation, the environment versus human behavior. There needs to be a distinction there. I think there does too. But when the bubbles come together, there's too much like um, confusion about that. So that's why there's a problem when people who are religious say it's 
um, it's natural to masturbate, but and but you're going to go above your nature and not do it. The red pillars would say it's a part of nature to be with a certain kind of man. Again, we're all using things in different kinds of ways that are all accurate in their own way, but also it's because of how we're using words. So when we say like, oh, it's natural for women to be with men and men to be with women and it's unnatural to be gay, what are we saying? Why is it unnatural? Like, how do you know that? You know, what is the evidence? And it's like, oh, well, this is how people procreate. Oh, so now you're putting contingency on the natural. Oh, this is the way it's always been. Maybe on the forefront, because we don't take dogs. It's like my parents saying, Betsy, I knew I would know if you were gay because as a kid, you always told me you like men or boys. And I'm like, yeah, but why would I tell you I like girls? You had no evidence to know your kids were queer growing up because you didn't create an environment where they could say it out loud. So your data wasn't even a full data. So when people say like there's no history of gay people, even though that's obviously not true, well, we don't even know what the data is because in our own homes in the modern world, parents don't even know they're living in the house with gay kids. You know what I mean? So again, like when I hear, oh, it's nature, everything is nature. But I understand the way we talk and we, we mean different things. I'm just explaining the, like when I hear that, my brain goes, oh, that's not, okay. <clears throat> about how a man could get a job and take care of a family by himself 50 years ago, they always make the ridiculous leap to say it's a woman's fault as if women are now working in those factory jobs in the 70s instead of men or instead of recognizing that those factory jobs just don't exist in America today because of capitalism. The corporations move those jobs overseas. However, for men who still believe and identify with that traditional image of masculinity as a provider, the removal of their ability to provide creates a pretty big problem from which most of the manosphere nonsense stems from. But this is not to undermine the fact that masculinity has always been a space of conflict for men as long as inequality has been a theme. One of the best examples of this is how the argument of what's happened to the real men has been recurring. Mad Men as the example, I love Mad Men, but also Mad Men is the example. Yes, aesthetically, very handsome, but also very misogynistic, very misogynistic, that bubble. Over and over for like the last hundred years. There's a great Twitter thread from Paul Freire. I could be wrong, but in real life, didn't even John Hamm cheat on his partner? I could be wrong about that. You know, he used to be a high school teacher before he became an actor newspaper researcher from Calgary, where he maps out this angst about men becoming less manly all the way to the late 1800s. They're saying the exact same thing we're saying now, which begs the question, at what point has real manhood existed? And the real answer to that is kind of never. Masculinity has always been in a state of conflict. And I'd argue that this conflict is a byproduct of capitalism and the competition that capitalism requires from men in order to compete for a limited amount of resources in a system that is designed. Never mind. I don't want to like ruin John Hamm's reputation. I guess he hasn't cheated, but some people think he has, but there's no proof of it. And I'm not going to say it otherwise. Sorry, I didn't want to discredit this man's reputation. To ensure that a certain amount of men will always fail. And it's no wonder that we see a spike in manosphere activity coming out of COVID. So many men were further faced with the morbid reality of this competition, mm. and let alone the overwhelming loneliness that social distancing calls for everyone. And the manosphere offered them simple but false answers. All yeah. of this history is important because the modern image of the manosphere kind of hides the reality of what the manosphere is and does and how it functions. Most of the manosphere yep. is just... <laughs> Rollo Tumati. <laughs> really, really weird guys and or really, really awful guys doing weird and awful things. But beyond them, the manuscript purports to be addressing real it's issues. It's just so vain, so egotistical, just so many things. Issues that men are facing. Issues that men have been facing. And while they do a very poor job of it overall, it shouldn't be missed that on multiple levels, many men find themselves in the manosphere for understandable and predictable reasons. Where men have limited economic opportunities and where there are too many men, right, you'll see more incels. Because first off, if there's too many men, then it's musical chairs, the mating market. Most people may- Unless they fucking- Monogamously. And so most people aren't sharing. And so most people um, are gonna be taken off the market as soon as they choose someone. And so that means that if there's too many men, there are gonna be more men even if all of them are perfectly marriageable, let's say, and that's not necessarily going to be true, then you're going to have more men excluded from the mating market. 
And this is going to get more intense if income inequality is super high, right? If, if, if scarcity is abundant at the lower end, because frankly, it's very hard to compete on the mating market as a male if some men are millionaires and some men are broke. Now, we don't just compete financially. Men also compete uh, in terms of their looks. Uh, they compete in terms of their personalities as well. That's not often talked about, but frankly, some men make great boyfriends and are super fun to be around and super positive and good company. Yeah. And some are, you know, intolerable and abusive. Right? I think the problem is, is that we like completely conflate like, I don't know who these people are. The worst aspect of the ideology with everybody who has any vulnerability that might make them susceptible to that ideology. And we're throwing it all into one big bucket. You have mm. the same set of problems or the same set of in initial issues, wage stagnation, social isolation, urban sprawl, lack of livable cities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, patriarchal expectations on men that have remained despite the fact that we've kind of moved forward in society past that. Men in general, I would say, are in a position where... Ooh, MM, good point. When no one does the job, poor job is welcome. Say what you want, but the other options aren't addressing the emotions behind the problems men have. Mm. They've not been given the socialization of the tools to move into the future of the world as it is becoming. Mm. They're still tied to a world where getting a wife or a partner is tied to a level of economic coercion mm. over women that doesn't exist anymore. In the midst of what society has become, they are rallying against the future right like they are they are yes. explicitly they are explicitly saying and electing to make a choice that like i want life to be this way i want to live in this patriarchal reality i want to call the shots i want to i want a woman that does xyz in in the vein of this 1950s era kind of bullshit and if you look at the study on it a lot of it is like men are making less money than they used to and women are making more money than they used to i promise you that if you back off that bullshit women were more than will more than meet you halfway in regards to economic situations here's another aspect of the manosphere that is often overlooked you ever notice that many of the most visible actors in the broader manosphere tend to be men of color andrew tate is half black sneeko is haitian and south asian fresh and fit are north african and afro-caribbean respectively kevin samuels is obviously black hamza is pakistani and even going back to earlier eras you have guys like rouge v and tariq and she this <laughs> god i forgot about them oh that's like that was so long ago do you guys remember oh that's like wow i forgot that era of youtube this is an interesting Twitter, thing yeah. to notice that often is glossed over the manosphere is greatly a white phenomenon but that's mostly just by the sheer numbers of white men on the internet the visible most popular parts of the manosphere have always been men of color I believe because white men had to maintain a pristine image of moral virtuousness and progressiveness that they cannot be as openly anti-feminist and misogynistic. Something like the manosphere that builds itself on this regressive misogynistic patient. I always thought it was because white people in America tended to reject tradition at faster rates than communities of color. Uh, just because of sheer numbers, but also like rebelliousness against your family structure is much more prominent in white communities. Disowning family uh, as a white person is much more prominent in their communities than in people of color communities. So I always thought like I I feel like the reason Menosphere is often people of color or men who are brown is because they also hold on to like traditional toxic views of masculinity longer than white men who are willing to be on stage wearing a dress, right? Like, so I, I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. Imagery just can't effectively tie itself to white masculinity because that would conflict directly with the way racism and white supremacy works. You can't have the image of misogyny and patriarchy be white men. Even as the predominantly white male ran Republican Party and Supreme Court seek to undermine and gut women's rights at every turn, mm. even the white men that populate the greater manosphere take on more intellectual veneers or maintain a nominity while their BIPOC peers tend to be more flamboyant and bombastic and thus... That is true. The brown boys are gayer. <laughs> they thrive in the attention economy. So there's some weirdness going on there, but it shouldn't betray the fact that the manager as a whole 
is genuinely racially diverse. I've spoken at length about the black manosphere, but there's also the phenomenon of Asian American participation as well. I won't go into it more. I'll leave some further reading in the description. But the point of bringing this up is to show that the manosphere is diverse because the hegemonic ideal of what masculinity is or needs to be centers around explicit traditional ideals of what a good man is or what a good life for a man should be. And these traditional ideals almost always center around conservative stoic images of masculinity, sexuality and gender. So all of these men are chasing the same overall goals and aesthetics, and the manosphere tells them that they know how to help them get there. Or in the case of Red Pills. Yo, who's that, Hamza? Tells who's them this boy? That they know. Wow, nothing hotter than a slit in the, the eyebrow, bro. Nothing more masculine than a slit in the eyebrow, my bro. How to help them get there. Or in the case of Red Pills, Black Pills, Incels, etc. It tells them who to blame for them not being yo you know what myron should do because myron got a really i'm sorry why do people have such bad hair pieces no judgment i love you all myron needs to go to that toupee guy on tiktok have you guys seen the toupee guy on tiktok he makes great toupees for men they're so good bro honestly they're vibe like they're they look really good that's who myron should go to because whoever he goes to it's not good that's not even the hair piece. He wore like a toupee hair piece thing recently. And I was like, it's not good. Like I want men to feel comfortable. I want them to feel good in their hair. If women are wearing wigs, we should all wear wigs. Honestly, if I go any bolder, look at, you can see my balding is like very interesting. If I go any more balding, like I'm just going to wear, I'm going to wear the cutest wigs all the time, bros. Like if I lose all my hair eventually, otherwise, you know. Able to get. And that belies one of the core problems that the manosphere is telling boys and men how to be a thing that doesn't exist. Mm. It, it just genuinely doesn't exist for most men out there in the world. And my perception is that that's what often brings about the most toxic behavior, because imagine chasing something that you're mm. constantly being told is real and you're being told yeah. that you can get it if only this thing happens if only you buy this course or if only these women or queer people or whatever stop doing insert x thing this creates a paradox which brings us frustration bitterness and dysfunction and all of that is not new but today it is more volatile more organized more toxic and more widespread men have always had these same problems and you know what's ironic is so many of them are not raised this way. So many of them, their fathers are not like this. So I'm like, where did you learn this from? You know what I mean? Because I've realized that too, like some of the young guys, including my like little brother who like liked Tate, I'm like, our dad is not like this. Our dad is like the opposite of this. What are you doing? You know? And then I think about other people that I know who are attracted to the red pill Andrew Tate bubble. Their fathers are really, really good people. Yeah, they're not millionaires, but they do pretty good for themselves. I mean, damn, they always made at least six figures. They have a good life. They raise them well. Like, I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like, you're not even raised by fathers like this. So I'm curious about that, too. There's obviously two groups, right? The guys who maybe didn't have fathers like Andrew Tate. And then um, the guys who did have fathers and still ended up in that bubble. It's just so curious, you know? Why did that happen? And many men have always blamed women for these problems, but we haven't always had the modern manosphere to collect and organize those individuals together. And therein lies the key that I think is most interesting to talk about here. That's a good point. Cosmic says the problem with traditional fathers don't actually raise their kids in the communicative way. Yeah, I will say, I think like my... Dad tried his best, but I think he probably didn't stay up to date with, like, the Menosphere bubble enough to, like, counter. He's been trying to lately to counter the ideas with the boys. But it's been weird. It's been weird because we're all adults now. You know, we are all adults. So ultimately, like, my dad can do so much. It's too It's too late, you know. But, yeah, it is interesting because my dad's not like this. My dad's a gentleman, bro. My dad's a gentleman, you know. My dad's, like, a pure-ass gentleman, you know. Treats women really well. Treats me really well. Um, definitely did not raise us being materialistic, you know? We know a nice bit about why young boys and men come to the manosphere, but we don't know a lot about why they stay or why they leave. And more importantly, who benefits from their presence within these online spaces and how all of that makes the entire. Wait, DeFreak, you said women stopped respecting beta male providers. That's what happened. I don't know what bubble you're in. 
But first of all, most people do not refer to their partners as beta or alpha. That is a very specific bubble that does not exist in a normal world. Like in the normal world, like people don't use the word alpha and beta. And if they do, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. And also like, you know, <clears throat> um, like it depends on why you're dating. If you're dating to settle, like you're just dating, you're in the dating market game. That's different. My parents fell in love. So my parents believe in love marriages. They think you should never get married if you're settling. So I was raised by parents who said never get married if you're settling, only marry the right person because like ending up with the wrong person is worse. So I was always raised in a different, a different, I had a different expectation. You know what I mean? So again, like I'm not sure that people are even being, like do people know they're in a game of their own choosing? You know you're choosing to play the dating game. It doesn't, it's not real. It's only real because you've decided to make it real. But like this dating game, this hypergamy bullshit, this like find a guy who's 1%, like all of this is a made up game and you're deciding to play it. It's like you're deciding to be vegan and then complaining you can't eat meat. Situation much worse. I'm kind of an expert on the manosphere at this point, which probably isn't saying a lot. There isn't a ton of research on the Manosphere for various <clears throat> reasons, one which I alluded to in my first Manosphere video, which his his hair looks really nice here, is that there's an overall reticence to study men as a troubled population from an explicitly gendered standpoint, or God forbid, to study white men as an explicit population and not just as a default population to measure everyone else against. I vividly remember being in grad school and like, maybe 2014 telling one of my professors that I wanted to study Gamergate mm. and she was like what's that and as I explained it yeah. to her I saw her eyes roll in the back of her head she <laughs> told me to consider finding something more significant to study a year <laughs> later Elliot Roger would commit the first Ooh. of several incel related shooting sprees in the last decade damn thankfully today the topic is being taken more seriously but it takes a while for academia to fully dig into a new topic, so there just isn't a lot of research on the Manosphere. Hence, there's a pretty low bar for being an expert on the Manosphere. But to remedy this, I actually did a little bit of independent research. And I'm going to talk about that research in the next section, but I want to be clear, this is not academic level research. I actually have a real background in academic and professional research and design. You know, I appreciate this, like him giving us this warning. I and this was not that. There was no review board. There was no oversight and development of these questions or appropriate ways to identify and collect the population sample or a cleaning of the data. Real academic surveys can take weeks, months, maybe even years to develop over time. I literally made this in a day. So as I talk about these findings, understand that they rank low in the scale of empirical quantitative research. All right. Unlike other times, do not cite me on this. That's it. I found some interesting shit here. So I posted this survey on Men's Lib, a Reddit mm. board dedicated to healthier engagement with discussing masculinity and the problems of men. I highly suggest for those of you looking for a more productive, healthy community of men to talk to while trying to figure shit out. I also sent it to Red Pill Exit and Incel Exit too. Ooh, interesting. Courtney says, do you still do consultations? I'm not sure what you mean by consultations. I do still do one-on-one -on -one calls. Remember, you guys are the structure deciders of the calls. I do not decide what we do in the calls. You decide what we do in the calls. I have one spot available right now through Patreon, and that's it. Everything else is booked. I already have enough callers as it is, and I am so grateful for that. But I'm dedicating most of my time to streaming and being available here. Join the Discord if you don't want a one-on-one -on -one call. That's also a really good space. And I do spend a lot of time there, meaning like I do events and stuff. And I'm there. You can tag me and talk to me. Uh, if we need more one-on-one -on -one time, we can talk about that. But otherwise, like, uh, there's only one call spot left as of right now. That's it. Okay. I've got a lot of people behind the scenes doing calls. And I'm grateful to them. And I want to give my life in dedication to them because it's all the spoons I got. They're taking all the spoons from me in the best way possible, in the best way possible. Ooh, I should make like a musical about spoons. Other Reddit boards with self-explanatory names, and I posted it on my YouTube channel page. And the goal was just to collect that info from as many places as possible. Not so much the Manosphere itself, but its former members. Hmm. Before doing this research, I had a few theories and typologies on what I expected to find. My first theory is that most men and boys in the Manosphere spend a relatively short time there. That guys may have a Manosphere phase and then grow out of it, which mm. also makes me believe. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I believe that the most active in the evangelical members of the Manosphere are younger men or boys, essentially, who yeah. don't have a lot of real experience or perspective on what manhood and masculinity might look like. So mm-hmm. they might be more impressed by the bizarre behavior of an Andrew Tate or a fresh and fit. But overall, mm-hmm. I think older men tend to find the antics and behavior of men in the manosphere to be ironically emasculine and undesirable. Agree, hard agree. Desirable. Get out, get out. Get out, get out, get out, get out of here, bro. You're here as an opportunity, get out, get out of here. Get out, get the, get the. Why do these women keep validating these men by going on their shows? Cause that's what you're doing. That's why I won't do it. Like I don't ha, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I won't ever do it. Cause like, if you, if you paid me enough, but like, you know, but like just in general, probably not. Like I just couldn't even imagine what dollar amount would be worth this. But like these men would be literally nowhere without the women on these like shows. They complain all the time. They're like, you know how hard it is to get all these women on the show and you got to book times and these bitches like they cancel last minute. Stop going on these shows. But I get it. It's worth it monetarily. There's like an exchange. They end up promoting their OF or something like that. So I get it. I do. I do get it. But also, oh, girl, you'd have to pay me to show up. I wouldn't even fuck like I don't even want it to go towards my OF. I better get paid to even show up. Oh, the emotional labor just to end up in the, well, this room smells. I just know it does. I just know this room smells. Make it phone. Get the megaphone. You ugly. You see, no, yeah. I, I don't want, I, I just, I just. <laughs> this is the worst. <laughs> Further over time, most men within a normal range of life and behavior will figure out that women are not as bad as the manosphere tries to present them and recognizes that the manosphere's energy and rhetoric will always make the distance between them and women much further. Real men, while still capable of misogyny and harm toward women, find the type of rhetoric and behavior they see in the manosphere embarrassing to associate with. A really good example of this can be found in the relationship between Andrew Schultz and Fresh and Fit. <gasps> I love Andrew Schultz. What's he going to say? I love Andrew. I watch Flagrant all the time. Andrew Schultz is no progressive, you know, leftist, feminist figurehead. He's a relatively, like, strong reflection of normal male attitudes towards social issues. And when Fresh and Fit came on the Flagrant 2 podcast. Great pot, Great episode of the podcast. As him and his co-hosts mostly said, you Akash, got- Akash. I sound like idiots. So whether you like it or not, People are looking at you as a role model. You guys have established yourselves as role models from simps to pimps, which is another motto I find kind of corny, but I (laughs) I looked into what you guys are about. (laughs) And a lot of this shit is just childish, which is fine if you want to be funny. We just talked about how doctors ain't shit for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. We are not in any way life coaching. We are not in any way trying to help men outside of, hey, come have a laugh for a couple hours. If you're going to paint yourself as life coaches and then say, so Schultz played good cop and Akash played bad cop and Akash was like very like this I'm gonna be critical and Andrew kept kind of built he played good cop so he was like building the bridge but the way Andrew and Akash talk about their wives is significantly healthier than Myron or Fresh could ever wish to have Walter Myron and Walter could ever wish to have in their relationships so I listen to flagrant pretty often like most episodes I would say nine out of ten episodes I, I listen to probably And I do appreciate the way they talk about women. I appreciate even the way they talk about LGBT people because it is the most normal but liberal view. So they're obviously not conservatives, but they're also cool with everybody. And I think I I get like I call it the normie, but also bubble hopping view. They do bubble hop a lot because they're comedians, obviously. Um, So they know. But, you know, like. Yeah, you know, I mean, I just don't really fuck with black girls. Like I guess. And since then, they've had an ongoing, although minor feud between. Mm-hmm. Myron, you are sensitive, talentless, bottom feeding grifter. Your life's work is renting women and regurgitating other people's talking points. <laughs> your arms are not developed enough for the shirts you wear and your co-host is pimping you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I am so childish. This is so funny. Myron says Andrew Schultz. And Akash Singh are some of the biggest snakes on YouTube. Fuck them and their whole team at Flagrant. Fuck, that's so funny. Oh, that's so fucking funny. Jesus. Being fresh and fit, this loser duo, and Schultz and his partner on the Flagrant 2 podcast. Oh, but there's academics. I fucking don't like academics very much. Did you hear what happened with him and McMills? The trauma between men is crazy. Men are so dramatic. Everyone's so dramatic. Men like to play like they're not dramatic. Cap. I'm calling Cap. 
podcasts who are much, much bigger, much, much more popular. You asked me if we watched their podcast. I'm a 40 year old man who's happy. Why would I watch that podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I only watch it when I'm fighting with my wife. Oh, yeah. like, These guys, get <laughs> These guys <laughs> understand, bro. They understand Yo, women. Yeah. And when you go and you look at the comments from that video. I'm a 40 year old man who's happy. Why would I watch that? Literally so funny. Yo, you kind of get an idea of how normal everyday guys think about the Manosphere and their big time avatars. Guys in the Manosphere are of a unique breed. Most men in the manosphere spend only a limited time there, somewhere between six months to a year, I hypothesize. Ooh. To further explain this, I break down the manosphere participants into three specific types. First, there's the users. These young men and boys come for a specific purpose, such as learning how to dress better or improving their conversational abilities, you know, social coaching, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Skills that mm -hmm. once they master, they don't really have a reason to stick around much longer. Because they're looking for specific things, they also don't participate as much in the larger, broader community. They're much more likely to. Can I can I say something? I do think the same thing works for some feminist bubbles. Not all of them, obviously. There's some really deeply rooted academic feminist bubbles that are lifelong journeys. But superficial sort of like girl boss bubbles, maybe not feminism as much, but the girl boss bubble. I think that's also the equivalence for some girls who are coming out of high school and they want to be like grown up and they want to know what a woman is and how to be. And I, I think those bubbles really helped me temporarily. But eventually I had to leave because it felt like it was very just like immature and it was very shallow and it wasn't like deep. And I wanted something more in depth. So I feel like women also have these bubbles. I think that's really normal. I think everyone needs it for a time, which is why, you know, as content creators, you have to decide what kind of an audience you want. I want an audience that grows with me and it always has. I'm so grateful for that. But I try really hard not to maintain a younger audience, you know, so I, I want you guys to grow with me so that way I don't become stagnant. But I can see why Fresh and Fit, <clears throat> they're attract, they attract mostly younger people or people who are really, really never going to go anywhere anyways, which even they say that Fresh and Fit have literally told their audience, most of you listening will literally never do anything with your lives because you have to be so exceptional to get to our level, which to be fair, they are quite successful. And I, I think that's like not I don't have to like deny that in order to also criticize them. Right. So it is interesting. You know, Kay says, yeah, the Manosphere was just a stepping stone in my journey of introspection when I was young and I got out of a bad relationship and wanted to learn how to change things. Mm hmm. And then I got some tools or some good tools and I dipped because the rest of the shit was too smelly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kenny says, Brittany, what is your age demographics? A majority of people are between the ages of like 25 and 35. Um. I've got a few people less than that, not really any minors, and then a few people in their 50s. To be connected to the more peripheral figures I mentioned earlier or spaces like no fap and pickup artistry. This also means they're not as evangelical about the manosphere, mm -hmm. nor do they identify with it as much as a part of their identity. They're just looking to find some things that might help them accomplish a goal they have in mind. And this may oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, it says blah. Yeah, the a lot of those women validate people like Fresh and Fit too. the whole quote. If you make 50K, you shouldn't be dating. Shit is awful. Making anyone feeling so less than like that man or woman is ick. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's also like those women. And Abin Priest just did a really great video about that recently. But yeah, I think that narrative is so not normal. Like, like, guys, a man making 50K is fine. You can have a life off that. Now, maybe you won't have a provider life, but provider lives are superficial anyways. Who fucking cares? But also, like, you do you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just, like, the like 50K, that's pretty good money. But also, if you want to make more than 50K, that makes sense to me. Like, you can talk about that. But again, like, 50K is, like, pretty decent. You know, if you're willing, if you're, if you're willing to live a 50K life, if you want more than 50K, get a job. Right? Like, I'm not going to marry a teacher and be like, can you make more? Like, just, you know, live lifestyle. It's all about lifestyle. Makes it easier for them to get out when the getting is good. The issue is kind of what you were <gasps> addressing. I was just watching Irrelevant this morning. Uh... Oh, he's talking to him. I was just watching Irrelevant this morning. In which is the, so the real social world is scary. I imagine that the vast majority of people who are incels are probably similar to me when they're they're just very 
risk averse when it comes to like approaching and talking. Yes. Oh, I have a good story about this, but I'm not going to tell you because it would take too long and I don't want to deviate from irrelevant. But oh, I have. Yes. Yes, that seems to be very common, like risk averse incel, total, a new category of incel I learned about where I was like, oh, I never thought about that. Very interesting. Because look how handsome Relly is. Really, like Relly's very handsome. So it's not his aesthetic that's the problem, though I guess some girls wouldn't like it. I think it's so aesthetically pleasing. But I understand he's like got a career, he's doing good, but he's also very young. You know, I think he's actually in a relationship. I could be wrong, but I think I heard that. <clears throat> talking to people. They don't want some random guy walking up to them and bothering them and things like that. My case is a little bit unique because I actually didn't care too much about rejection. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people do, mm -hmm. um, but even still, I'm gonna have similar problems because I was not I was talking myself out of going up to these people. And it just resulted in me not getting experience, me not even trying. And then in many of these cases, I would later figure out these people wanted me to talk to them. These yeah. people wanted me to do these things. I have my own struggles with like understanding relationships and, and, yeah. and closing and, and stuff like that with girls. But I, I, I just kind of powered through it. But I still, I remember the first time I tried shit I learned from mm. like the game huh? at like a nightclub. <laughs> yeah. You know right. what I'm saying? And it, and it worked. Right, yeah. like it, it worked. It got, I got numbers from that night. I remember that. Yeah, night. it's basically like a lot of those people would just like tell you, like you know, go out, socialize, meet people, which is again like good, like healthy thing. Back in my mind, it felt like a little bit weird and almost predatory in a sense because you're supposed to be focusing on like meeting women and like you know, quote unquote, hitting on women, but part of my mind was just like, well, if I was like really a sociable person, like I would interact with like anybody i just be out with some buddies having a good time and like you mingle and like that's how people normally meet people right. and like mm -hmm. really like when you're out in a social environment you can literally talk to anybody it's just about having sort of like a social awareness or acuteness and like knowing how to interact and you know deal with inevitable rejection the point i was getting to earlier it's like i was talking to one of the coaches and basically he says like 90% of the people who get into sort of like seduction or PUA get out of it. Like there's a big turnover. It's like 90% get out of it in a year because they either they meet somebody or they learn how to, you know, get good with women. And like they they learn like how to, you know, properly socialize. Zatsman and Irrelevant, who I talked to for this video, might be examples of people that you might consider users. Although I don't think either was necessarily a member of the manosphere. Both dealt with challenges socializing, dealt with challenges in their romantic experiences, and found the world of men's self-help as a recourse. I even have admitted to reading the game back in the early 2000s after a bad breakup. Mm -hmm. We often stereotype and malign men's self-help, and rightfully so. There are numerous pitfalls to where this stuff leads. We also stereotype the type of men who struggle socially or with intimacy as overweight basement dwellers with poor hygiene. True. But this just isn't accurate. If you go peruse any incel or manosphere related message board where guys want you to rate them, you'll see a lot of guys that aren't so bad looking, at least mm. to the point where their looks are the key problem that they're facing in improving their dating life. But it's hard to get them to see that, which usually puts them in our second category. I'm so curious if FD is going to talk about the mental health perspective as well, because I just think that's got to be playing a role, right? To identify as an incel or femcel and not just to identify as single makes me think like that's got to be some sort of mental health perception issue. Because like, again, in my bubble, like you would never identify as involuntarily uh, celibate, you would just identify as single, you know? So I'm excited to see what he says about it. <clears throat> the second category is what I call- Whoa, is that too fast? I wanted to speed it up a bit because I'm, my spoons are a little waning lately, like the last few days catching up. I did that nine hour stream and it was too much. I pushed myself. So now I'm still recovering and my fibro has been kicking my butt because I've been, anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that I want us to go a little faster. Sorry, it might be a little fast for a second. All the truthers. They come to the manosphere with less explicit goals. Sometimes they just wander into it from other anti-feminist, anti-SJW spaces or content creators. Sometimes <laughs> they start out with a goal the same as a user might, but end up sticking around possibly because they can't find or activate on the resources that they might find in that earlier self-help section, which forces them to dive in deeper to explain what they're dealing with. This has the byproduct of making them build a stronger affinity toward the rhetoric and the community they engage with. Community is a highly underrated aspect of the manosphere that I'll talk about a bit later, but these guys stay a little longer, which means it often takes a whole lot more effort to change and pull them out. 
positive developments such as a new romantic success or a new community or a new friend group or some type of other intervention might pull them out. Also, over time, they might recognize that the toxic rage cycle that the manuscript pulls them into is probably not good for them. They get disillusioned with a variety of internal inconsistencies and the constant infighting and the public derision for associating with such a toxic group and leave out of boredom or shame. This is the group that might even be reachable through a YouTube video or even a debate that exposes them to better. Oh, I don't know who that is, but her makeup is so good, bruh. Real Smith in the chest is identifying as an insult as part of the part of a massive problem where people feel empowered by identifying as victims. Um, I could see that. It's definitely a victim narrative, right? To identify as that. Oh, she's gorgeous. Who is this? Their ways of thinking about their issues and hopefully better ways of dealing with them. This group is probably the largest or maybe the most visible part of this community and probably spends up to a year or more in the community. And then lastly and most concerningly is the lifers. This is basically the previous group, except much, much worse. Their vulnerability to manosphere rhetoric is stronger or enhanced by other factors such as their appearance, difficulties improving their economic or social standing, and possibly even genuine behavioral or mental disabilities, along with the absence of forces and resources that will get. Chat says her name is Moon, Mooncat or Moorcat? Ooh, Mooncat or Moorcat? I'm seeing two different names. She's gorgeous. She's made videos shitting on the manosphere. Oh, I don't know who she is, but she's gorgeous them out they don't have a strong support system that can see what they're going through and figure out a way to get them to the other side they're mostly just stuck in whatever environment they're in for these folks they begin to really identify with their rhetoric and accept it as their truth and move with it look at these guys look at justin waller he's little smoking my cigarettes like uh my pipe my uh my fucking phallic uh, cigarette you know my uh, cigar in perpetuity attaching themselves to the community because that community might be the only one that they actually have access to considering that the modern manosphere is only 10 to 15 years old it's hard to say just how long lifers stay in the manosphere there's a prominent member of the black manosphere who's in his 70s Rolo Tomasi and coach Greg Adams and others are men who are clearly in their 50s and they have fans that have been with them since day one way back in the mid 2000s Damn. So who knows how long lifers actually stick around. So this typology is something that I had mostly figured out before doing my little survey based off my academic research and my experience observing this community. So how did these hypotheses line up with my bootleg research though? My survey had nearly 2000 responses, which is a really good sample regardless of the quality of the questions. Mm. My first question was what age did you first encounter the manosphere? To which the vast majority over 40% of the respondents said that it was in their teenage years between 13 and 17 with the next largest group being 18 to 23. Those groups together made up 70% of the respondents. And of course, this should have been expected considering the population that has access to YouTube and Reddit to begin with. Again, yeah. not a perfect survey. Most respondents spent one to two years consuming manuscripts. Again, I really appreciate that he's saying not a perfect survey. This is a sample. Lots of people do this kind of work on YouTube and think it like represents all of the population. And it's just drives me crazy like you're obviously sampling from your audience. So or from a specific bubble. But like I really appreciate FD clarifying that your content and around 70% of the respondents spent two years or less consuming the content. Mm. Meaning that as mm. I predicted, most people don't actually spend a lot of time in the manosphere, which makes a lot of sense when you think about the way that manosphere content works and how it often works in cycles. The manosphere big figures of 10 years ago are not big figures today. And the ones yeah. that are big figures today won't be big figures 10 years from now. According mm. to my survey, less than 10% of manosphere consumers spend more than five years consuming this content. I think Sneeko's going to grow out of it. That's what I'm hoping for. I think Sneeko is going to grow out of it. I think by his 30s, like 35, like give him 10 years. But I do hope he grows out of it. And I think he might. I do. I think I don't I can't see him staying in it for long. He's just it's stagnation is not a thing Sneeko's interested in. He might look like he's stagnating. But if you've known him since he was a teenager, that's not what's happening. So I just can't imagine his stereotype, like his his category of human. So when I say this about Sneeko, I'm not saying it about the consciousness because like I don't know the consciousness. I'm saying it as the category of man he is, the type of boys like Sneeko don't stay in these groups for very long. It wouldn't make sense. But he could, like, because I could be misunderstanding him, he could stay in this group. But he probably won't just based off of the type of, like, category he falls into. It just wouldn't make sense. But we'll see. We'll see if he's doing red pill content in 10 years. And participating in Manosphere spaces. So far, my prior research and this survey kind of line up. In fact, most of this survey validated what I assumed up until this point. I had questions about why you came and it showed that it was about, you know, improving masculinity and learning how to attract women. The most popular space that the respondents participated in was red pill spaces. There are a lot of responses connected to negative views about women. Again, this survey isn't up to academic standards, but I'm confident that any of you enterprising gender studies folks watching, if you wanted to do something like this for a master's thesis, you probably find similar results. That said, 
The survey revealed something that I wasn't expecting, that I didn't really think about, about that population of truthers or maybe lifers, that if in any way accurate is really horrifying in its ramifications. What I found in my data is that the manosphere seems to have the strongest, most lasting hold on boys who encounter it at a younger age. In analyzing the study, there's a clear pattern that shows that the older an individual was when they first encountered the manosphere, the shorter their length of participation is. And again, this corresponds with my earlier argument, but that also has a really scary counterpoint, which is that as the age of the first encounter with the manosphere goes down, the amount of time they spend associating and consuming this content goes up. When I isolate for those who encounter the Manosphere at 12 years or younger, the amount of respondents that spend five years or more consuming Manosphere content triples, which means that there were young men in this survey that went through most of puberty and are entering into young adulthood whose entire understanding of masculinity and manhood Oof, is informed by the that's Manosphere. Rough. They have oh, that's rough, bro. That's a rough. No experience of being even just pubescent boys without having Andrew Tate type shit in the back of their head. More disturbingly, though slightly less significant in the data, is that participation in those more concerning and toxic areas of the manosphere, such as incel and black pill spaces, also has a small but noticeable increase the younger the person was when they first encountered the manosphere. So there are young men identifying with incel and black pill ideology that literally haven't had time to even try to date. I've been racking my brain to try to make sense of this. And to be clear, there's some reasonable explanations for one. This is a small part of the sample size. Only like, I think 200 respondents encountered the manosphere before the age of 12. And that always was skewed the way data looks. And this question in and of itself might have had the unintended effect of identifying the most extreme cases still. Even if these are outlier cases, they still exist and extrapolated to the greater population. We're talking about a lot of young boys being targeted and harmed by the manosphere at a very early age and harmed in profound ways that we really don't even understand yet. Mm -hmm. When you think about how YouTube and social media works, this is how it always works. It makes sense that there would be a very young population encountering this content because this content is mostly there for them. I think sometimes we overplay how widespread and dangerous the manosphere itself is, although it's pretty damn awful. So much of it is, you know, bullshit, weird guys, insular communities, and maybe a handful of insecure dudes that are just trying. You know, maybe I'd believe the menosphere more if their wives showed up or their relationships were there. or They spoke highly of relationships. I just feels like they don't speak with love. Like, I'm not saying their wives have to be the content, but they don't even give me the reassurance that they're in happy relationships, which maybe red, but red pill isn't about love, right? It's about settling. It's about like what they think is perceived winning the game. Again, you guys have to decide when dating. Are you in the love game or are you in the settling game? Because if you're settling, so you're finding a partner you're the most compatible with that's good enough, that isn't like what exactly you wanted, but like it's pretty good. Okay, you do you, right? But like that's a settling game. If you're waiting for that one consciousness, let's say you're monogamous because I don't want to you know, disregard the poly people here. But let's say you're monogamous, you're looking for like the one person you're willing to commit to to do life with. Well, that's a very different game, right? Than going for the other thing, which is like you're good enough. Trying to find good enough is like fine. I think the red pillars in those uh, provider girls are trying to find like the they're trying to win. Like, oh, look, God, the part I got the best partner we could have chosen from. That means you're, you're dating because like for other people, almost like the validation, right? For other people. So, okay, think just you have to decide what are you doing, right? Because if you're looking for like the perfect person, right? The person who's going to understand you. That's a very different game than playing it, a game with somebody who like just happens to be associated with you. Like Myron always says, like, don't confide in your girl, confide in your boys. That's a very specific kind of relationship. If you're lying or hiding anything from your partner, you have, I think you should be upfront with that in dating. Assuming everyone is doing that is such a mistake, you know? Trying to figure out how to talk to girls better. It's not ideal, but considering the grand scope of things, those elements are not going to have such an awful impact on society as a whole or those particular individuals. Mm. But if you're encountering this stuff at 12, 13, 14 years old, while your literal brain chemistry is still developing and you're seemingly more likely to involve yourself in spaces with more extreme and dire rhetoric, that's scary. That should really bother us all. That's an awful thing happening to young boys right now that there's no protection from, let alone the rest of the people, specifically young girls and eventually older women that are going to be in contact with these boys. And the thing I really want to hone in on from this is that all of these Manosphere Red Pill channels know that their biggest and most reliable consumers are children, little boys who don't know any better. They can see it in their met. I would love to see their analytics. We can see it from how their followers behave. 
the things they find funny and so many of the interactions they have with their fans. It's always little ass boys that they're drowning with this misogynistic rhetoric. Now, I'm extrapolating this from my own imperfect survey, but I also found one paper that discussed narratives from incel Ooh. red pill exit. And this study discussed numerous respondents who were in their early teens when they began consuming content. A survey from the Anti-Defamation League on incels showed that 8% of the respondents were under the age of 18, but this is their age at the time of the survey, not the age in which they were actually consuming the content, which probably could tell you that they were probably consuming it much earlier. But even just mm. the common sense to know that YouTube and TikTok definitely have incredibly large audiences of teens and younger children. And we know that this is where much of this content lives and spreads. And when I think about that, we actually have to start taking it out of the Manosphere content creator economy and take it to the actual platforms that they're creating this stuff on. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, etc., all control what is on their platform. They know who's watching what, and they know the type of content that is spreading on their sites. It's ironic that the right wing has this groomer panic that they're using all the time about trans visibility and rainbow flags in school classrooms, yet in those same classrooms, there are young people watching Andrew Tate videos on TikTok, and nobody's mm -hmm. saying a damn thing. The biggest groomers and dangers to our children and their well-being are giant tech companies and the proprietary and secretive algorithms that they use to target, capture, and hold young boys in content bubbles that literally feed off content their bubbles. negative emotions all the way to the bank. One of the negative parts of it for me kind of comes from the left, less so from the people, but from the psychological effect of like creating content that's critical of the manosphere as a man in a way that's kind of, it follows the general trend of commentary YouTube where you're just making fun of some weird shit you found. I think it can be counterintuitive for the men watching, but also for just playing the hits to an audience. Like there's there's a incentive where if I go to make a video, I am way more tempted to joke about something to be like, what the fuck is that guy saying? That engagement, <laughs> I, it's incentivized and I don't like regret it at all. But over time, I've been like, yeah, this the way this industry works very much skews towards capital production over genuine art or genuine engagement with these ideas in a political context. On August 11th and 12th, 2017, an Oof. estimated 600 white men collected in Charlottesville, Virginia for the Unite... The biggest ick in history. The biggest ick. January 6th in this Tiki Torch event. If I was on a dating, like if I was dating somebody and they're like, oh, I was there January 6th, I'd be like, the biggest ick. And then if they were at the Tiki Torch event, I'd be like, how embarrassing. And I've done a lot of activism in my life, but I am like not embarrassed by any of the activism I've ever done. It might give somebody the ick, the stuff that I've done, and maybe that's fair. But like I, even my conservative family that votes Trump would never be caught dead at one of these. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The right rally. The rally was an openly white supremacist. Oh, they're so Oh my God. Oh. This event organized by various white supremacist groups coming to protest the removal. If they literally, they're only icky because of the context. They all are aesthetically very normal looking, but like look at their faces and their anger and the way they look. And I'm like, I never want to touch a man again. Oh, thank God I married a woman. Oh. Removal of a Confederate statue. It was met by counter protesters and quickly spilled into violence with multiple people being assaulted as well as one white supremacist driving his car into a crowd, Sad. severely injuring several people and killing Heather Heyer, a 32 year old activist. This event shocked the nation Sad. somehow. Mind you, only six months prior, a president who openly courted the favor of white supremacists took office. So I don't know who would have thought. I'll avoid harping too long on how surprising white supremacist activity seems to be with white people and focus on the fact that in the <sighs> aftermath, a lot of fingers began pointing directly at YouTube. At this time, YouTube was a focal space for what came to be known as the AIN or Alternative Influence Network, which was basically a loose network. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. Steven Crowder, James Damore. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, Lauren Southern. Oh, Destiny. Okay. Roaming Millennial, sure. Dennis Prager, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, some black guy. I've worked with Derek at events. I've worked with Tim Pool at events. Worked with Destiny, as you guys know. Worked with Lauren Southern. Uh, Owen Benjamin, I know of. Never worked with Candace Owens. Gross. Candace Owens is so annoying. Being a stay-at-home mom is the best job in the world, and if I could do it, I would. Um, You're worth like 20 million, girl. You could. But also, maybe you don't want to. I get it. Money's a priority. Steven Crowder. Okay, okay, okay. Network of all. Oh, Carl Benjamin. I've worked with him at an event, of course. Roaming Millennial is Roaming Millennial Lauren Chen. I forget because I've worked with Lauren as well. She's just as pretty in real life as she is on the internet. 
right and anti-SJW creators who often funnel their viewers and supporters into more radical and extreme belief systems, such as white supremacy, creating fertile ground for the growth of the alt-right, which had been in effect for years prior. Some would say since Gamergate, but I actually argue that the first evidence of the Internet's ability to galvanize toxic and extreme behavior from disaffected groups of men. I do think it's, I guess... Oh, Brittany Pettibone. Oh, that's interesting. These are very conservative right wingers. I guess Destiny was a right winger at first. I think it's weird to have him on this list a little bit. Isn't Destiny, though not a progressive, is much more liberal? You know what I mean? So kind of interesting that Destiny would be here next to Lauren. But I guess recently, yeah, Stephen Molyneux. Oh, I hate it. Ugh, I, his content was the worst. Um, Yeah, interesting. Why is Destiny... I guess so. I guess I I don't know all of Destiny's content. I only saw him the last couple of years, but I guess he might have connections to conservatives more than I realized. I mean, he certainly debates them. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Um, but it makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Obviously, I also don't consider Destiny an actual progressive, right? Obviously, I would watch FD Signifier as like a, he's more of a progressive. I think FD Signifier is much more of a progressive and authentic in his work than Hassan is too. Right? Like, Hassan is a performative progressive. FD Signifier seems like someone who's genuinely caring. Like, he works in his communities. He's a father. And then Destiny is a debate bro progressive, meaning he's just not a conservative. But he recently even called himself a centrist. So he's not a progressive. He even recently in debates keeps calling himself a centrist. So calling him a progressive is just so the debate click bros, like, can have a debate versus the, pro but he's not an actual progressive, right? Like he's just, I get, I get it, I get it. Men started with the hate campaign against Anita Sarkeesian in 2011. So for at least six years, YouTube had allowed the growth and festering of various reactionary communities on their website with minimal pushback. With this revelation, YouTube faced a ton of scrutiny for their lax policies, and it resulted in what was called the adpocalypse, which was essentially a lot of advertisers announcing that they would leave the platform if YouTube- And by the way, something that I've been seeing, which is fine, but I think I saw it. I have to ask. I saw it from Kyla recently on um, on uh, where was Kyla? I love Kyla. I'm going to be on a panel with her soon. I, I really do love Kyla. So like take this with a grain of salt. But I saw her on the um, the valuetainment show she goes on and she kept saying things like, but I'm not a crazy like person. Like I'm not a crazy liberal. I'm not a crazy liberal. I'm not a crazy liberal. I'm a centrist. And I'm like, you're also Christian, dude. Like you are by proxy conservative, but not cons you're conservative. You're a Christian who left the church because your brother's gay, which makes you liberal. But if you keep referencing progressives as like the crazy ones, is she talking about FC signifier? So I'm much more next to FD signifier than I am next to Kyla or Steven or even Kidology. Like I'm like, I guess I said, I'm more progressive than all of them, but I'm a little bit less progressive than FD signifier. But ultimately like I, you know what I mean? So it's interesting, like, when she, when, like, people place them, like, when they use language, like, I'm not, like, the crazy progressives. I'm like, which ones are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, which ones? You know, because basically you're just saying you're a centrist, which means you're definitely not a progressive. If you're a centrist, you're not a progressive. That's kind of the point didn't clean things up, which resulted in YouTube changing their policies on hate speech and information, along with a variety of other things, which resulted in a lot of YouTubers losing a lot of money very suddenly. Now, most of those YouTubers eventually recovered, but the core change was the fact that tons of your favorite anti-SJW creators saw their views drastically drop, and many of them greatly disappeared, and those who didn't disappear greatly altered their content, some even purporting to have somewhat switched sides in the aftermath. Either way, it's important to understand that YouTube's policies did not suddenly bar. Yeah, trolling. Yeah, Destiny donated money to the police department that FD was protesting just to troll him. Yeah, that's not a progressive move. Like, you're not a progressive. You know what I mean? That was, I did not like that. But, like, I'm a progressive, so I get it. Right? Like, I, I didn't love that. But, okay the presence of hate speech. It just required it to be heavily censored, more like euphemized in order to maintain its presence and made it harder for anything within that realm, well, some things within that realm, Blech. to get picked up by the algorithm. Still, the harmful rhetoric has always- Prager you is so bad. And has always been there. It's just more intellectualized, maybe a little bit more polite or polished, but it still serves the same purpose. So why hasn't YouTube done anything about this? The answer is pretty simple, because they haven't felt the need to, to be fair to them, to YouTube, where I do get my checks. How you guys doing? 
uh, they are much better than what's happening on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook, I mean, they got pulled into a federal hearing for a reason. And Twitter is basically world star hip hop at this point. Like never did I see fight in faces of death videos on Twitter until Elon took it over. That said, YouTube and TikTok and Instagram is where the manosphere tends to live. And YouTube is taking the same passive mm. approach to the problem of the manosphere that they did demonetize Fresh and Fit, though. They did to the AIN four or five years ago. Creators like Sneaker and Fresh and Fit were removed or demonetized on YouTube, but it's hard to imagine that it was for their misogyny because their misogyny had been going on for mm. months. Crook says Destiny debated Richard Wolf, capitalism versus socialism. He's definitely not a progressive. Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, again, I would say like Ethan's less of, the, of a progressive than Hassan is, and then less of a progressive than. FD signifier is right so again we all have different variations of this but like yeah I would say that it's I think destiny is probably branding himself reasonably a centrist I think he is a centrist I think that's a much more accurate term for him in terms of categorization I just think the debate bros like to call him a progressive because it works in terms of like the model because even the way he runs his relationship is very similar to like fresh and fit that's why I compare them a lot I know a lot of people keep like forgetting that I think they keep forgetting that the way he runs his relationships is very similar, but very different in context, like in very similar ways to Fresh and Fit is very different than the traditional relationships like conservatives are having and very different than the progressive relationships where it's like love marriages and consent and values. So again, like the reason I compare them is because we've got a centrist cosplaying as a progressive because he has an open relationship and he's a little bit bisexual, but barely even identifies with those things because he's not going to marry a man over a woman. So like, again, everyone's got this relationship with like all of these terminologies, but I would say that Stephen isn't conservative He's centrist. He's not progressive. He's centrist. Fresh and fit aren't traditional religious conservatives. They're new age manospheric conservatives, which is different because they also don't adhere to conservative values in terms of monogamy or, you know, like uh, religious uh, commitment or anything like that. Right. So, again, there's like all of these different things. DeFreak says you're kidding yourself if you don't think the far left has any hate in their heart or doesn't have hate in their heart. I don't know who you're talking to, but I'll just say like all bubbles have hate in their heart because all bubbles are collections of humans and everyone thinks everyone else is worse than them and they think they're the best ones. So obviously like the far left or whoever you want to say, every bubble has their extremes Right. So like, obviously, they're going to be progressives that are incredibly hateful people. That's pretty like common. They're going to be every kind of group is going to have the hateful group of people. That's just like humans are working on their hate still. Right. Like the, the like thing humans as a species have to work on. Right or years before they were being punished. My theory is that Sneaker was actually deplatformed because of his COVID denial and Fresh and Fit were demonetized because they were putting in false takedown flags on other creators. I don't think that either of them were punished for misogyny. Wow, what pussies, bro. Because that would mean that so many other creators would be punished for the same thing. And both of them were making big banks for themselves up until those points. Yeah, I don't think you can kick them off the platform for misogyny because ultimately it is an, uh, an opinion to an extent. And they do run a business that heavily makes women better off than when they didn't come on the show so you could argue it's a business deal that promotes like lots of women agree with fresh and fit so ultimately like women are also allowed to have this belief system so i think it's probably better that they're on the platform than not but i could understand them getting kicked off the platform for the reasons youtube did it points and conversely plus too many religions are inherently misogynistic as well so like what are you gonna do kick all of them off youtube it doesn't make sense for YouTube up until those points. So the obvious answer to why YouTube and other social media platforms allow this toxic content is money. While not as big as huge creators like Mr. Beast and his many clones, or your popular kids channels, unboxing, gaming channels, etc., the Manosphere and related content is still big business for these social media platforms. Yeah. And these social media platforms understand that allowing themselves to be user-driven builds in an advantage to cultivate audiences in every possible niche of content to make sure that they get a piece of everything. So there's not just a left tube and a Manosphere, there's also sports talk and book talk and barbecue talk and makeup tutorial YouTube and martial arts YouTube. There's tutorial videos on on YouTube with hundreds of thousands of views just for making really clear ice to put in alcoholic. No, I think you're wrong, Nibla. Cosmics are cosmic. You say but Destiny is definitely a progressive according to conservatives, which conservatives. But because of left wing infighting, Destiny gets shit on. There's no way a conservative, a real conservative, thinks Destiny is a progressive. He doesn't fit any of the tenets of what people think of as progressive. He's not pro communist. He's not pro socialism. Right. OK. Like, he doesn't uh, exist in any of the, like, protest groups. He's a liberal. You know you can be a liberal. 
It's a perfectly decent place to be in in life. There's nothing wrong with calling him a liberal. Like, a conservative wouldn't view him as a progressive. He doesn't hold a lot of progressive policy. Biden is not a progressive. He's a liberal, right? Like, pro like Biden is willing to allow progressive influence, barely, by the way, in his policy, barely, okay? But, like, again, progressives, like, he's not, if he's not like FD Signifier, he's not a progressive. If he's not like Hassan, he's not a progressive. He's not even like the other progressives. So, like, in which way would he be considered progressive? It just doesn't make sense. But he calls himself a centrist. So, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty accurate word. I feel like that is very accurate, you know? beverages. These companies leave no stone unturned because each one of these niches corresponds with a specific advertiser who will come there to spend literally billions of dollars a year to put their products in front of certain eyeballs. And traditionally, no set of eyeballs is more valuable and elusive than the eyes of boys and young men, the types of folks who do watch Manosphere content. But it's even deeper than that because I would argue that unlike a guy who just say wants to figure out a new recipe for a really clear ice for his vodka hobby, the Manosphere truthers and lifers that I described in the last section spend tons of time engaged with this type of content. And not only do they spend a lot of time being engaged, but they're also very predictable in that engagement. Can you kind of introduce your, your a lot of your pertinent expertise to the topic? Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Jordan Herd. I'm a PhD student at MIT and Harvard, and I make content around AI and society and nice. the existential crisis that we're all kind of having about it at the moment. Um, and my PhD research also uh, delves into AI for clinical applications. There's a lot of t a lot of different things tied up in how people come across this content. Some of which is, is algorithmic. Some of which is political in a lot of ways. Some of which is just like the nature of the internet and the kind of content models that people can very easily end Did up you with, see even with. I didn't, oh, upload models? Which is, is algorithmic, some of which is political in a lot of ways. Some of which is just like the nature of the internet and the kind of content models that people can very easily end up with, even without systems like the YouTube algorithm. Because if you grew up in a suburban town or like any sort of town, like chances are just the number of people- Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Sorry, guys. I just realized it was on me. Thank you, chat. Thank you, heck. Wait, what are you guys talking about? I'm so sorry. We can't see the FD video. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Let me rewind it. I'm sorry. That was oh. my bad. I'm a bad YouTuber. I'm bad at my job. Uh, I'm bad at my job. At I'm sorry. I got distracted by you guys saying there's H3 drama. Do I need... To oh, the video is gone. My video is gone. Oh my God. I'm so bad at my job. Sorry, guys. In Harvard and I make content around AI and society and the existential crisis that we're all kind of having about it at oh the moment. Um, and my PhD research also uh, delves into AI for clinical applications. There's a lot of t a lot of different things tied up in how people come across this content, some of which is, is algorithmic, some of which is political in a lot of ways, some of which is just like the nature of the internet and the kind of content models that people can very easily end up with, even without systems like the YouTube algorithm, because if you grew up in a suburban town or like any sort of town like chances are just the number of people who are espousing these kinds of ideas publicly is going to be low mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um there's only so large of a group assuming that you even find these people in the first place you can really create around that the the impact that that would have um on on kind of larger society in a lot of ways is just not that big but now there's the internet so you and a hundred thousand of your best friends with problematic views can all get together places and end up, you know, reinforcing ideas and themes that are not very healthy, as well as almost delving further into, you know, conspiracy thinking around why you might have trouble talking to girls. Going back to my bootleg survey, if this were more developed or if I were ever to try to do it again, I'd probably add more responses to discuss and get at how much these people hate women. Because in one section where I gave the option for a direct individual response, I got a nice amount of responses that implied that hatred for women was a driving factor for consuming Manosphere content. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Manosphere and Manosphere adjacent content, there's a persistent trend with presenting women-centered rage bait. For those who don't know, rage bait is basically all this content that is made to make you angry. It's mm -hmm. showing a person, usually a woman or maybe even a kid doing something they're mm, not supposed oops. to do. And the best rage bait content shows them getting what they Yo, do. Every time someone talks about the Cheesecake Factory, I just want a cheesecake. I feel like it should be illegal to mention the Cheesecake Factory unless you give me a piece of cheesecake. Dessert. I have a whole video on it on the B-Sides. Check that out. Look at how bad this is. Look at- But simply put, when you look at a lot of Manosphere content, it's usually feminist gets owned by facts and logic for not knowing her place or some bullshit like that. It's lowest common denominator content that is only built upon the worst inclinations that some men have, but the red pill manuscript- Oh, look, it's Andrew Wilson. Type guys eat this shit up because one of their main things is this crusade. Damn, that is a big lady, bruh. 
That is a uniquely large human. That is so fascinating. Oh, look, it's Farah. Farah. Ah, la, 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 la. Against the inherent evilness her. of women. And they will go to their channels like clockwork to consume that content because it gives them that emotion. Engagement um, and, and how platforms define engagement has changed over the years, I think largely for the better. You do still end up with this problem of like, well, if we're looking at optimizing engagement, we're often looking at amplifying strong emotions and uh, disincentivizing nuance. You know, if you were already on that kind of slippery slope, so to speak, I think you're a lot more likely to kind of fall down that. Whereas, especially if you have a, a friend groups or, or familiar groups or, or otherwise um, interpersonal social support systems outside of that, you might come across that like kind of intellectual dark web, but not quite like super far right video and listen to what they're saying and kind of be like, mm, I don't, this, this doesn't like align with like the actual conversations and people that I know in my real life. So I'm going to like move away from this. Um, and I do person think that like, this is exactly what I was looking for. Engagement is driven by making the viewer feel strong emotions. And one of the easiest and most reliable emotions to build engagement around is anger and disgust. These young men and boys have so much anger and disgust towards women. Most of them will tell you outright. They'll be in this comment section. Watch. And if they don't, then we still know they're lying because of what their content shows us. And the scariest thing is that these strong emotions are predictable because they're addictive. Again, you will find some who are honest and they will tell you that they themselves know that they're in a negative feedback loop with Manosphere content. They know that they're not helping themselves or improving any of their... It's interesting because I would say like, I don't know how honest a lot of the Manosphere content is. It feels very dishonest to me because anytime you have anything that counters it, they just say like, you're the exception, which is like very common for people. I, I don't know. DeFreak says, who isn't using propaganda, though? This is now gaslighting. I think the Menosphere and certain groups use it a lot more. So I would say that right-winged people tr use and are willing to use more propaganda-feeling tools to get their messages across in their videos viral than progressives, like, generally speaking but the propaganda is within all groups because propaganda is just like information to move an idea forward and to convince people to be on your side in some ways like it's to convince you regardless of fact like to be on their side but I do think a lot of grifting occurs more in conservative bubbles than in left-wing bubbles and I think that um it's like a very specific phenomenon because the right is more conservative and capitalistic I think they're more than open to playing certain games you know they're willing to lie to you know sort of push an agenda not that leftists don't do that not that liberals don't do that not that that doesn't happen in leftist circles we've seen that with the BLM issues we've seen that with content creators that's not what I'm saying but there's something about the conservative bubble that just allows for a lot more grifting I think than the leftist bubble um, but that makes sense to me, I think. But I, I think generally all humans allow a general allow like they allow an, a general allowance to everybody to um, sort of exist in a falsehood, I think. Yeah, it says left twists right straight up, make shit up. I, I would agree with that. I would say the left does twist things sometimes. Absolutely. Like I'm the first one to talk shit, right? But the right wing, because I came from conservatism, I know they're straight up lying. I've worked in, I've worked with opportunities to get into talk radio. They straight up coached me to lie. And when I said, I'm not going to do that, they just didn't move forward. Like, which makes sense. Like they straight up coached. Now, with the leftists I've worked with, they have never been straightforward enough, enough to say lie. They will twist the conversation to encourage me to lie without saying lie. So it's interesting, like in a way, because if you're naive enough, you'll fall for it and you'll be like, oh, I'm just like, oh, da, 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 da. but then when you realize like, oh, that's a lie, like you're trying to get me to lie. But the right wing will be like, lie, you lie. You know what I'm saying? So that's the difference. And I think that that's sort of significant because a lot more naive people will be tricked on the left side than on the right wing side. The right wing side, you're like literally consenting. If you're in the game, if you're a content creator, if you're a YouTuber, if you're in the game, not if you're a viewer, the viewers all get fucked ultimately. Masculinity or dating options by consuming this content on a regular basis, that this content is making them more angry and miserable. 
but they're addicted to it. They're so wrapped up in it that they kind of can't stop without some type of intervention. And this is also a response I saw on the survey. But it's not just my bootleg survey. We saw this with Facebook and QAnon. We see this with Flat Earthers. All of these alternative spaces and the way that social media drives those spaces kind of builds upon the same mechanisms that I don't know they've hacked within the human brain, knowing that we will keep coming back to certain things if they make us feel a specific emotion. But that's from the consumption side, because if we're going to be honest, this content is also addictive as a creator. Every video we upload is, is especially for, for me, like trauma. So like, I mean, like, Trolling says there are a lot of pl there are plenty of examples of leftists outright lying. This might be a bubble issue. Well, I agree. There are. I just think there are more on the right. I think there are more grifters on the right, just in numbers. But like that makes sense, right? They're more prone to making money, which means they're more likely to do those things, which means they're more likely to be okay with the business model because it works within their values. Um, like Sneeko said the other day, who cares if Trump's a billionaire or not? The point is like you're selling a message. I do think in general. Both sides are willing to do that. I just think the right has more people who are willing to do it because it, it doesn't val violate their sense of value. I talk about black incels. I talk about anti-fatness. I talk about, um, you know, domestic abuse and stuff. The things that we talk about, especially when you bring in the racial component, racism, gaming, the racism in the Indian community, when I talked about it, it's always things that are going to be so incendiary, so polemic that you know you will piss off someone, if not everyone. The commodification of this and the commodification of our grief and how we have there's a McLaughlin quote that basically he, did he say posting a video is trauma no he said he posts about his trauma like he makes videos based off the struggles he experienced growing up basically says media is the children and we are children of the media so you make what you want to make supply and demand type of thing we make manosphere videos because we know they work and because they work people continue to make them which is an oversaturation of demand for manosphere anti-manosphere stuff and we help put their name out there. Which will in turn dictate the limitations and the, the um, perimeter around what we will be able to make successfully sometimes. Mm. Manosphere content is a reliable money maker. And that's because not only will these guys watch rage bait Manosphere content to get their jollies off by hating on women and complaining about feminism, they'll also come and watch anti Manosphere content too. They're so addicted and tied to this Manosphere rhetoric and so protective of it as a community that they feel driven to consume it and defend it on all fronts. If you look at the comment section of any anti Manosphere video, you will see them here arguing and trolling and being hateful in the comment section. Mm -hmm. You barely ever see the opposite. Literally, anytime I, I literally avoid certain people on the internet because the toxicity from their audience is so clear. Every time I post a, t a Tate video, I basically never read the comment section fully because it's always just like the most like angry men ever. And I'm like, girl. And same with Manifesto. Like I read the comment section, but it's just the angriest women ever. They're so angry. And I'm like, girl, like, no. Certain communities just like have the most angry communities, you know? And this only makes any video you make about the Manosphere have a reliable floor of viewership and high metrics in your engagement. I guarantee that this video will probably hit a million views in a month or so. I'd be shocked if Damn. it didn't. If I don't fuck up the thumbnail and the title or it gets age restricted, give me maybe 40, 50 days from its release and I guarantee it'll hit a million. Why? Damn. Because the Manosphere dudes will be here in my comment section to argue about what I'm saying. I've heard people that actually watch my content say, I don't know why the YouTube algorithm keeps on suggesting to me Manosphere content. Mm. And that's because the algorithm doesn't have any actual like insight on the individual. It just knows how patterns work. And since genuine Manosphere consumers will watch Manosphere content to get their jollies off and then hate watch anti-Manosphere content, the algorithm just knows, hey, there's a connection there. And so it keeps on trying to play our content against each other. There is genuinely no more valuable and predictable audience to cultivate, at least on YouTube, and I would argue still on TikTok and Instagram and on Twitter, than Manosphere people. Because they are the most online, they're the most reliable, and they're the most easy to manipulate. It's the truth. Who are already entrenched in the Manosphere side are probably more likely to kind of watch both in the sense that both of them kind of get them riled up with like negative emotions. Whereas mm -hmm. I feel like people on the anti-Manosphere side find watching that kind of content um, stressing. Almost as a, a pressure valve. Yeah. Well, not the Manosphere side. Oh, like, watching like, yeah. Let's stop. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, that makes sense. I think it ends up being a pressure valve for people to like release some frustration about it, but it isn't something that, you know, you come away from it being like, I am now more upset than I was before right. and like right. have this righteous anger. Right. And in, in, the same way, I think that if they were to go up to the Manosphere side, they like click in and then within five seconds, they're like, oh, no, <laughs> true. Like, this is not what, what I come. That's my lived experience as well. I watch a lot of things because I'm a content creator, obviously, and I'm going to talk about it. But as a person, as like a Britney, it's true. I watch FT Signifier because I'm like, oh, yeah, like vibes. And then I watch, you know, um, 
the, the red pill or whatever to be like, ooh. And like, I'm not watching it as a viewer because I'm like, this is gross. This makes me feel bad about men in the world. This makes me hate men, but not literally. Like, but it does evoke that emotion in the same way I'm sure men watch it and go, ooh, this makes me hate women. But like, I, the irony is like, as a woman, I watch it and I don't, I don't know if the Menosphere knows they're making me hate the men, but also I don't really like the women on the panels either very much. I just don't like this group of people. I just feel like it invites like the worst of society into a little bubble, but it's just because of like the category of people they are. And that's like the issue. So I, I, I definitely relate to the sentiment where I just, you know, if I'm watching content for me, you know, for me, not the content creator me, but the, the me, me, um, yeah, I do not. I'm not going to watch Menosphere stuff. It's And I don't want to watch Menifestel. It just makes me feel depressed because it's just so sad. It's just like the world's against me. Everyone's like against you, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can't. It's just not a vibe. To content for it. It's, yeah, I still get messages to this day from like, mostly from men telling me that like, mm. you know, they'd, they'd seen their friend like start to go down the rabbit hole and they'd sent them my video and that had like taken them out of that rabbit hole. And nice. I've had like, yeah, loads of lovely DMs. But obviously I've had the negative stuff as well i had you know, a lot of comments from people from the manosphere especially when it first came out as well people trying to sort of debunk me but not really doing much of a good job in the comments but i think that what people mostly say is you haven't done your research when like clearly <laughs> i've looked up quite a lot of studies for this video the main people that i was um, talking about in the video was his name rollo tomasi he did a, he did a live stream not, not longer after i put my video out and um he did a live stream where he was reacting to my video on his channel and that brought a lot of Obviously, a lot of traffic over to my video when he did that. But yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? I don't, I don't really mind. But it's not just us. There's also tons of mainstream media looking at the world of incels and the manosphere. I think there was just a big expose on Vice or one of these other mm. media conglomerates we that followed this. around a bunch of incels from the UK because humans, we have just this. We watched this. Remember that a lot of these ones were diagnosed autistic. And I think that plays a huge role in socializing, you know, especially if you have parents who don't like help you. Um, and you find a group where you feel like you identify or you hyper focus or like special interest your way into the manosphere and in seldom. I just think that plays a huge role. Neurodivergency is going to play a role in how you process your own existence. And studies are showing or articles are talking about how neurodivergent people, often autism and ADHD, feel incredibly traumatized by the way they grew up because they feel like they're being gaslit by society, especially society that doesn't even know how to talk to them or they don't know how to operate because like they're viewing the world differently. And I think there's something about that that like, kind of probably overlaps with a specific category of neurodivergent incels, right? Like just a very specific category, right? I just think like it's got to play a role because again, to identify as a fem cell, incel, vol cell, all of that makes no sense to uh, just a, a, a well, like a normal person. Like you can't, you can't be a normal fucking healthy and well-adjusted person and need to identify with any of these words. It's called being single. You're just single. That's what it means, guys. So again, the words we use can tell us so much about where we are. The words we use to describe ourselves can tell us so much about where we are mentally and where we are emotionally. This desire to peer into the world of people we think are odd. All that said, don't get me wrong though, this shit gets tiresome, at least for us on the opposite end, because it becomes tedious and at least for me, it feels kind of exploitative at times. This is why I only dabble in the subject every few videos, same with foreign men. Noah has tapered off on his weird guy quest as well. Moon is the best of us. She made one video and said, all right, that's it. I'm out on you motherfuckers. This mm -hmm. was what Zatsman was struggling with himself. Zatsman could very easily, if he wanted to, keep making those types of videos and get a larger following because even if he's not saying anything new, it would still boost him up a little bit to give him more options as to what he True. can make in the future. But if you go back and watch that video, Zatsman's talking about not wanting to be this crusader, but wanting to be a creative. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this shit literally pays the bills. But before mm. you judge me or anyone else, Let's think about the actual pro manosphere content, which is even more embarrassing because, you know, many of them don't actually even believe in what they're saying and making, but they keep saying it to keep feeding their audience the same rage bait. It does not take much to notice that just pearly things just says things that she knows will get her more True. clicks and clout and that nothing True. of what she said. She needs to eat the cupcake. She's so ugh. is of any actual value to her personal views or character as long as it keeps feeding her clout. I mean, people, they lie all the time, but saying things that, uh, for their own lives aren't true. But I mean, ultimately it comes down to, to algorithmic incentivization, which is a thing we're all subject to. But like you said, it's um there's a different tone when there's the, that sort of backing, which I, I definitely and, agree with. There's a, so I think I agree with you too uh, a little bit, Noah, because there's like, I think there's like, um, 
curly things who clearly mm-hmm. is just saying the thing. Oh yeah. Like hundred percent. It's really she's amusing. Shameless. 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 She's a past Morgan. <laughs> it's, 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 no effort as well. It's that's sort of the most annoying thing. The, the effort that she puts in to make the money that she's probably making is insane. Like she doesn't phone. edit a thing. She'll sit there <laughs> scrolling through her phone on a video. Doesn't even bother editing, editing it out. But people will sit there drooling because she's saying the trip. Because what well, that's the thirst of this of this community. But yeah, like it speaks to like so it's really low effort. She's been debunked and owned and drugged so many times. Yet she persists. And she doesn't persist based on talent or effort. Like I give Andrew Tate a lot of credit for being talented he could have picked almost anything to do as a public figure it doesn't speak highly of the audience when his successor was pearly things it clearly that wasn't the key ingredient to Mm -hmm. his success former clown prince of the manosphere sneeko has said on several occasions that he rolled the manosphere red pill wave these last few years because it was hot and blew him up but despite all this the addicts in the manosphere do not care they will fall for the same exact trick within a week with the next guy that pops up. The only silver lining for that community is that every once in a while, one of them or one individual maybe starting upon that journey sees what's happening and says, you know what, this is weird and I don't wanna do this. And you know, shout out to those guys. But the truly depraved Mm -hmm. individuals like your Andrew Tate or- Like think about it, think about all the diverse amount of guys on YouTube, right? And just think about how many of them are not red pill and remember that. No matter what bubble, Rhett and Link, the Hank, Hank and John Green, um, even Steven, Abba, think about um, more popular, I'm trying to think of more famous like YouTubers, I guess. Think about like, um, I don't know, uh, Julian, think about um, any of the any of the guys who are actually pretty big in the world and think about how many of them are not Red Pill. So Red Pill is a minority community of men that feel this way generally. And keep in mind, all of the people that I've named are partnered or and or in relationships and or variants of, Evan and Steven are single as far as I know, but regular men, like the most normie men, the more you go popular in general population, they're not only partnered or at least have good friends, Casey Neistat, married with two kids, three kids. Like everyone has glowing relationships with the women in their life. Ethan from H3 History, has a wonderful marriage, three lovely children, and a great relationship with his mom. So, okay, like, think about all of those people, okay? Like, think about all the normies. Like, go more popular. I think Stephen and Abba are maybe too small of a demographic. Even Ethan, go, go, well, actually, he gets, no, I think he is big enough. Anyway, go very big, go very big, go very typical. Go, like, very big. Those normie men, okay, they're not menosphere dudes. So, again, like, you know, think about all those, those, think about that. Just think about the average dude in the world. And I think like you would realize like, yeah, men just be chilling. For the most part, everybody's chill. Everyone gets along. I think about my friend Ricky Shucks or Timothy DeLaghetto or Timothy Tancharansu. Like I think about those people, like none of them are in the red pill. You know what I mean? Like why would they be in the red pill? They're like, they have good relationships with women and they're men. You know what I mean? Like people like them. People like them as people. You know what I mean? Tim's a dad. He's a daughter. You know what I mean? And so, again, I just think about those people. They have good relationships with their parents. You know what I mean? I just think about those, like, men. And I'm like, yeah, that's a normal dude. Red Pill is the minority. They are the niche feminist group, but, like, menosphere, you know? And that's the thing is, like, yeah. That's why I joke that, you know, oop, did I lose data? No, I'm still here, right? YouTube is like, you've lost data. Okay, excellent cl- a c- connection. Anyways, I just want to like point that out. Like, normie people be normie. You know, just remember. Just remember that, you know. Um, sounds as I know about you, Brittany, because of those normie YouTubers. Who? Who? Tim and Rick? Who? Other people? Again, Steven and Abba don't count. They're the weirdos in this sphere, too. They're too small. H3H3 H3 is kind of weird, but also more normie because he hangs out with Howie Mandel and all those people. But then Abbott does hang out with Schultz, but then Schultz is in the comedy bubble. And then Steven's too chronically online, even with his collabs. Though Piers Morgan was good. He did very good on Piers Morgan recently. Steven killed it on Piers Morgan. It was really good. So that was great. Um, but still, he's just kind of getting more mainstream. But like, if you look at like the normie people, just like, I don't know. You know, not that misogyny doesn't exist in normal bubbles, but you know. Your devout truther weirdos like a Jordan Peterson never waver in this rhetoric and continue to return to this cash cow. I will again remind you to all the Jordan Peterson fans, shout out to Jordan Peterson's prior psychology career. I understand true and that it was beneficial to a lot of people, but most people who know who Jordan Peterson is now 
would not have known who he was had he not became this manosphere mis true dianic figure period argue with your mama look at the research and the data and the timeline that is facts true. the manosphere is a giant engine that keeps the machine running and everyone gets to eat off the people who consume this content and most of them don't get shit and there's like a cynical part of me that doesn't fucking care and wants to make the full-on andrew tate video once every two months it would be so easy because I know it will do numbers. And I will use that money to take my wife on vacation and take a picture of us on the beach and tag your favorite <laughs> manuscript creator who hasn't been kissed in the last six years Cute. and say, you made this possible. But there's also a bigger Cute. part of me that actually cares about the men and boys targeted and harmed by this content, especially now realizing how young they are and how much worse this content affects those young people. And that's the thing that I think still isn't talked about enough, that despite the amount of harm being done by this population, <sighs> This is a population that at its core is being exploited and they're being mm -hmm. exploited based on real areas of vulnerability that are, at least from my perspective, hard to talk about because someone can be both victim and perpetrator. And that makes it difficult to fully engage with the totality of the subject because you want to leave room for the victimhood in play, but not so much room that any type of change or accountability for that behavior is pushed to the side. Yes, exactly. I have tremendous sympathy. You want to meet people where they're at? and hold them to the standard that makes sense for where they're at. For people who are victims of incel violence, absolutely horrible. I have tremendous sympathy for people who are who are subject to incel vitriol. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who's received death threats from incels. We can talk about the manosphere, and we can talk about it as one chunk, but in terms of my feelings about them, right, I have much less sympathy for, you know, the red-pilled playboy who's using and abusing women deliberately mm. through a bad divorce mm -hmm. or have gotten their heart broken once and or twice, and instead of handling it productively, they went off the rails. Mm -hmm. Very different from an incel who is fundamentally, in many cases, just going to be a lonely man with a personality mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, my Manosphere video series is something that I'm greatly known for, really proud of, but there is one glaring analytical flaw, a flaw that I knew was there, but I didn't want to address because I didn't know if I could address it appropriately. And that flaw was that I did not touch on the difficult to engage with relationship between these toxic communities and the population, specifically the fact that a lot of this population is disproportionately neurodivergent. I knew going in from my own research that there was a clear relationship between the manosphere and autism spectrum disorder, but I didn't know how or where to fit that in. And I didn't feel like I'd be able to talk about it properly and that I might end up doing far more harm than good in the process. So I left it out. But not long after that video went viral, I got a response video from a creator named First as Tragedy, and he kind of took me to task on this glaring omission from my video. That made us your poll. It wasn't necessarily my audience. And then from here on out, I was like, to get that same pool, to get that same content creation, I can't do my normal ableism disability analysis. My real niche, like I did like a video on like speech disorders um, and kind of ableism with speech disorders. I can't, you know, that's not going to pull, you know, the same manosphere um, crowd. For me, I think it speaks to an issue in the broader political left mm. of how disability is approached. Mm. Um, and then I get big on a manosphere video. But I don't think people came there for the disability angle. They came there for the manosphere stuff, you know? First, this tragedy correctly points out all of the things I mentioned as risk factors for falling into the manosphere, poor social efficacy. You know, I think about that, like he, I don't know much about that content creator, but making like disability focused content or awareness focused content about disability. It is interesting because in a lot of these bubbles, they want you to pretend like you don't have a disability. They want you to pretend and hide and mask and act like, and sometimes I get it, right? Like we all need to function as a society. But I also think that like, I don't want to encourage society to pretend that there's not a part of society that needs some sort of attention or that like people you wouldn't even think have something do. I mean, David Goggins pushes his whole narrative of like he suffers because of his ADHD, but instead of taking medicine that helps him, he like self-flagellates and like lives in a loop of my life is hard and tough and it's harder than so many other people's and that's how I know you can do it. But like also you could just take meds probably, but maybe not. Maybe Maybe he's tried all the meds and it won't work. But it is one of those things where, um, yeah, obviously we want to be able to talk about it, but also, hmm, interesting. The extensive engagement in online communities and internet consumption, higher risks for childhood trauma and abuse. All of these things are things that people on the autism spectrum are more likely to experience. And oh. again, this is something I knew, but was afraid to get into. And the reason I was afraid should be pretty obvious. I didn't like the ramifications of implying that being autistic made you more prone to falling into the manosphere or- True, but that's why I say mean autists and nice autists. I think people who are 
they have a pre because I think children and those children get socialized, but also the predisposition of personality leads them in directions. And I believe in that because I think we're biology, but we also have the ability to, I think, evoke what I call free will. So I think that you fall into different categories at different parts of your life. And I think people who are predispositioned to being a nice autistic end up a nice autistic and people who are mean end up mean autistic. And so they end up in the mean bubbles, like Reddit autists that make fun of you for everything with meanness and malice. They're different. Uh, groups of autists that, like make fun of people, but with no ill intention or are blunt or shitting on something you love with no ill intention. They're not even trying to be mean. Those are nice autists who like are a little blunt. Who cares? But like the mean autists that are like, I know I'm being mean, so I'm going to say it. Like, oh my gosh, they fall into very specific spirals. And the neurotypicals, same thing. Nice neurotypicals end up in certain bubbles and mean neurotypicals end up in certain kinds of bubbles. But if you're in an online chronic community, you're more than likely, I'm going to say neurodivergent. I am going to say it. If you are especially online for more than like, nine hours a day, like straight up neurodivergent. There's like, what are the chances a neurotypical is wasting nine hours a day online versus neurodivergence? We actually get a lot of fuel from it. They've been doing some research on children, how neurodivergent kids who get screen time react more positively than neurotypicals who get that much screen time. So all this like depression study that's coming out on like how screen time is bad for you and it adds to your depression is more prevalent for neurotypicals than neurodivergence from my understanding, right? So again, if you are well-intentioned, you're not actually trying to be mean, you certainly don't want to be mean, known as a mean person, but you talk, like when I say autistic or autist or acoustic, or I say words that make me laugh, I think something, there's something so funny about blunt people. It just makes me like, it makes me go, oh my God, that almost hurt my feelings or that kind of hurt my feelings, but I think it's kind of funny because I know you don't mean it. I don't want to be mean to you. I don't want to be cruel. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I literally do not want to be mean to you. But I also notice that the way I talk naturally, the person that I am, the thing that makes me laugh about being a person sometimes makes people think I'm being mean to them. And that bums me out. But at the same time, I have to pick me. I have to pick me because I've already grown up in a whole world that has rejected me for who I am, right? Like hence the borderline. I can't keep picking you over me when I know I'm not trying to be mean. I'm really not. But I know if I'm trying to be mean because I've been mean on purpose before and I will say I was trying to be mean, my bad. So again, I think like mean autists end up in some of these incel Reddit groups and nice autists end up in like, you know, just like different spaces, more inclusive or sweeter spaces with a little bit of an edge, but it's different. Like one is meant to tease, like my discord is a very neurodivergent space. We're very nice, but we're also very, very blunt. And we can also be very nitpicky about language. And we can also like, oh my God, my Discord, I'm sure for the wrong person feels like a bully space, but for the right person should feel like your siblings are like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? It should feel good. Like we've we've definitely like, I've loved seeing all the new influx of new people. It, it, it should feel like a safe space that is for being yourself, which means like there's going to be conflict naturally, but no one's meaning to be mean. Nobody on the Discord should be intentionally trying to be mean or trigger somebody. That is never the intention. I do not want a community that purposely tries to trigger people. So we're the nice neurodivergence, but the mean neurodivergence, the mean like, they'll find a way. They'll find a way to trigger you. They'll find a way to make you cry. Kayleen says, is it mean autists or angry, sad ones that release that through mean behavior? I wonder if those guys are genuinely bad or just so miserable they project their BS onto others. Um, or is that still mean? I mean, mean, angry. I would still say it's pretty mean. You know, I would say it's probably that they're more mean. I'm going to be honest, because I think meanness comes from a place of caring less about other people around you. Right? Like, I feel like the people in my Discord really, really, really like love people and mean well, but they also won't let you slide on your bullshit. 
Like the point of my discord is to be like well-meaning, but no bullshit. So we don't like complainers. We don't like whiners. We don't like people that are like self-victimizing. We usually like that's not going to work. But at the same time, like if you want to vent, if you have a problem, if you're triggered, we love you, bro. We've seen it happen on the discord before. So like, the intentions are good, but if you get triggered in the wrong space, if you are just venting in the wrong space, you will get bullied to hell with the mean autists or the mean certain people. Like, it will be bad. You know, peanut butter popsicles, you text just like a person I've banned from my chat like four different times. You sure you're not him? Because no matter how much you want to hide it, you sound just like him. And I am a neurodivergent who notices patterns. And you text just like him. And he is a very unique person, his own little consciousness. And you just remind me so much of him. And no one ever reminds me of him but him. That's how unique of a person he is. You text just like him. I'm almost tempted to block you on principle. I'm so tempted. I feel like you're him pretending to get around the ban. I feel like I'm doing it. Mm, I might do it or more prone for any particular harmful behavior. And I want to be clear, that is still true, despite where some of the data tends to take us. Autism or any other form of behavioral disorder is not an excuse for toxic or harmful behavior. It might help better understand it and better figure out ways to address it, but no one should get a pass on the type of harm that people in the manosphere participate in just because there's a high propensity for certain marginalized neurotypes to follow this ideology. Tons of people are autistic and don't become misogynists. In fact, the vast majority of autistic people do not lean into misogyny as an identity. Further, research tells us that people with behavioral and mental disorders are far more likely to be victims of violence than to commit violence. We also know that the vast majority of violence is committed by neurotypical... No, no, no. Nobody check IP dresses or anything. I'm just pointing out that I'm watching you. Mama Simon sees all... Normal people. So let's keep that in mind. Also, it's important to recognize how this particular data point serves as an ableist talking point used both to shield manosphere content and the people behind it from criticism for what they're actually doing True. but also to promote ideas around the need to further control and ostracize autistic people because of their strange ways and unpredictable and potentially dangerous behavior these arguments cannot be taken seriously we cannot hand wave the men spewing violent rhetoric online just to say we need to control the neurodiverse population consuming it instead this type of ideology infantilizes people on the spectrum while at the same time absolving the bigger forces from their responsibility in the harm that's being done here so please recognize that the goal is not to vilify neurodiverse people as uniquely dangerous. Amen. I agree with this completely. But to force us to consider the totality of what's happening here. Disabled and neurodivergent individuals, if they're, if something doesn't happen, they're led to desire neurotypicality or able-bodiedness. And I think that then leads them to issues to where there's this kind of conflict between their own disability and then the desire is placed upon them by all the systems to then lead them into desiring um normativity and then that leads them into like when you think about manosphere content i when it comes to neurodiversity and the autistic uh, community i specifically think about pickup artistry um which when i was younger i don't know about today but when i was younger that was very very prevalent to where it would be recommended by the algorithm it, it was mainstream when i was yeah. uh, in my 20s like, yeah, yeah that was on tv it was in books so a lot of times autistic people don't necessarily have access to romance we get into the whole male loneliness stuff here i forget the statistics but like Male loneliness is raising, and that's always getting the focus, but also mm. female loneliness is also um, raised as well under statistic for the autistic community. It is a thing of having access to intimacy. It isn't always there. And what avenues are you kind of drawn to? Mm. That said, there's a lot of emerging research that indicates that the manosphere, particularly incels, are more likely to be neurodiverse along with suffering from other major behavioral or mental disorders. A study from 2022 mm. in the Journal of Behavioral Sciences on Terrorism and Political Aggression found large disparities for depression, anxiety, and autism for incels in comparison to the prevalence of this in the average male population as reported from the World Health Organization, which finds the prevalence of autism in less than 1% of the male population, while the sample from the study found that it was nearly 20% of their population. This is mm. a near 2,000% increase as reported by this study. But this isn't the only study. Another study from 2022 postulated that the formal diagnosis for autism in the United States adults was 7% and found in their sample of incels a formal diagnosis rate of 18%. But they went further, compared rates of informal or self-diagnosis, and their sample reported a rate of 74% of incels compared to just 5% in the normal U.S. population. As of mm. time of writing, these studies are less than two years old, and academic research on the topic of the manosphere in these communities is... I am the most excited for this research to continue because I've had this theory for a while. You guys know I rant about it every time. 
that neurodivergency is playing a role. Everyone thinks I keep making an excuse, not you guys, but like when I was talking about Vosh and his degeneracy, and I'm like, how is autism not playing a role in Vosh's category of person? And everyone's like, you're making an excuse. You're making an excuse. How does Sneeko's age not play a role in his like, obvious like his decisions in life? You're making an excuse. It's like you're fucking just, you're, you keep doing this thing where you assume everyone is 26 is the same or everyone who's autistic is the same. Everybody's having a completely different relationship based off their category. It's like when Fresh and Fit say we have a very diverse group of women that come in, a very diverse group of women that show up on our show, college, European, American, blah, 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 blah. Yes, but they're the same type of woman in each group. Guys, you are a trope. And every single person falls into a trope more than others. Every girl that goes on Fresh and Fit or the whatever podcast is a specific type of woman with the exception of like when Kyla shows up and even Kyla um, is her own version of the trope that would be willing to go on those podcasts, but she's not the same demographic as the other 90% of women, right? But Kyla is still like another category of women willing to go on the podcast, right? But 90% or 99%, I'm making up numbers here, of the people that show up on the whatever podcast are the same kind of woman found globally. It's the same category. So when I look at Vosh and I go, oh, you have enough tenants of these attributes that put you into this category. Like, it explains a lot, right? Cam Cam, uh, or Camera, I'm sorry, says Vasha subscribe. No, wrong. Sorry. Oh my God. That's not what I want to read. What did I want to read? This one. Haleans exist as can society please learn the difference between reason and excuse drives me nuts. We ain't saying it makes it okay. Literally. I love FD signifiers. This is the best part of the video already. I can tell because this is what I'm interested in, especially as a neurodivergent person who's trying to seek out like proper diagnoses. If I have any left that I haven't discovered, I would like to know, but it would make sense because this is my... <laughs> This is what I care. I could listen to hours of this. Very, very new and understudied. And if you know anything about academia, you know that it takes a good five, six years for people to get working theories on how certain data presents phenomenon. So feel free if you're seeing this in mm. 2025 or 2026 to say, yeah, he was off base on that because the research is showing otherwise. That's fine. In reality, I kind of doubt that future findings will contradict these early findings because Same. if you consider what we know about autism and other behavioral and mental disorders and how society treats people with those challenges, you can see how the engagement in toxic online spaces is very much a risk factor in something that is going to happen more commonly for those. And on top of that, not to like, oh, I want to say something out loud. Should I say this out loud? Okay, I'll say this. And with female incels, no, female autists, who might be incels, they're often identifying or misidentifying themselves. Instead of thinking they might be demi, they think they're incels or vemcels or ve whatever. They might just be demi. Do you get what I'm saying? Like you keep thinking, but maybe you're just demi, dude. Or maybe like you're identifying with this word for a reason, but like if you're autistic or neurodivergent and you actually want to marry for love, yeah, you're going to have to find a very specific person on the planet, just like anyone would be. So, of course, your chances would be lower. And I think if you're autistic or neurodivergent, you are more likely to want authenticity in your relationships. I do. I think neurotypicals are more likely to settle. And I think some autistic people are willing to settle. But a lot of them would be happier in a would be happier in a relationship they deem as like real. You know, like a, a not settling, an ideal relationship to an extent. You know, I think. So I'm like, I'm, when I'm thinking about categorization, like, you know, obviously some people with autism will settle. But a lot of neurodivergent autistic people will actually prefer. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know? individuals. First, this tragedy illustrates in his response video that people with autism are more likely to have difficulty socializing. So we'll spend more time online. And we'll hey, peanut butter. You know why I think you're him? Because you knew his username and you knew exactly how to spell it with the capitalization and everything. But you're pretending like you don't know who he is. Listen to your comment. Oh, I had a TBI. Very funny. Did this guy who's this seven? Like, why do you know this? Did somebody write his name in chat? Why are you even writing it perfectly? Why are you copying it? Why are you interested? Wait, did somebody write Seven's name in chat so he knew who it was? Because people didn't write it properly. You're the only one who wrote it properly, right? Am I crazy? 
Did anyone else write his name in chat? Am I crazy? I'm watching you, bro. Don't try to get one up on me, bro. Have poor educational and economic outcomes and thus poor romantic options and will see. Query says, wait, is demisexual a real thing? I thought most people are like that. No, it's definitely real. And most people are definitely not like that. Or it doesn't even matter if they are. It still can make it real. I'm definitely not demi. People just wrote it. Okay. Okay. If people wrote it, I believe you. But did they? I can't see it. Maybe I'm missing the comment. Okay. Okay, did somebody write it? Because I'm not seeing anybody who wrote it. Guys, did anyone write it? Because I didn't see it before he commented. Mm, feels like that's a lie. Feels like that's a lie. I know I said it last week too, Hannah. Peanut butter knows they're on my list, okay? They know I'm on, they're on my list. I wrote it. Okay, Ingrid wrote it. Okay, peanut butter, you got out of this one. You just type very uniquely like this person. Nobody types like this person because their level of autism is special. And you remind me of that person. I know because you write just like, you text just like them. So I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I won't ban you yet. It's too interesting. But I swear, if you give me any more inklings, I might ban you. <laughs> the appeal of a guy like Andrew Tate telling you that he can train you to be normal as very desirable. You have to recognize that these creators are purposefully targeting vulnerable groups, whether autistic or not, and exploiting their pain and struggle in life to do further harm and exploit them. And when you see the rhetoric used in the Manosphere, the <clears throat> constant hurling of ableist slurs, the coded language around consumers of Manosphere content, it indicates that they know exactly who they're talking to and why they're talking. Wait, no, wait, no, no, Ingrid, you did not write it. No, see, you did not, it is, it has to be seven because you didn't write it correctly. No, you didn't write it correctly, Ingrid. You didn't capitalize the zero, the O. And this person did for some strange reason. Bro, <clears throat> you it's on YouTube. I copied the title of the video. Mm -hmm. See, Ingrid, you didn't write it exactly right. You didn't capitalize the same numbers he did. Crush you. Ooh, I'll crush you, bro. Into them that way. Not only what you mentioned, but also that the manosphere and right political right wing content creation is leading them to a solution that lands them within bounds of normativity, which is the same as that he got. Where did the video go? Why did the video stop? Sometimes when I switch it over, the video stops and I have to reload it in. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. Okay. From the, fam the nuclear family, which oftentimes try to make them normal through um, ABA, uh, applied behavioral analysis. The same lesson they got in special education, the same lesson they got in labor if they're unemployed or underemployed, and, you know, this overall cultural apparatus. So, though, I think another appeal of this kind of manosphere thing is this idea of finally achieving the desire of, of achieving normativity. In a sort of Lacanian sense, making that happy making the teacher happy, making your literal, you know, parents happy by finally achieving that normativity. The Manosphere offers the promise of better performance of masculinity, which to boys on the spectrum is the promise of being normal. But conversely, these boys are put in a negative feedback loop and really hooked on their own brain chemistry to an extent in this cycle of hope and then anger. Mikey with the super chat says, super chat war, ban peanut butter if we reach 200, cult organize. <laughs> Stop, stop. I do think it is seven. I'm almost positive he's trying to ban evade because he's tried it like four or five times. He tried it on Patreon multiple times and he's the only person in chat who spelled his name correctly with capitalization and no one would have known that but him and no one tried to do it but him. So I feel like I'm within reason, you know, to think that uh, that is seven because like why would you know the capitalization of a username you're pretending not to know? anger and then rage and then shame and then maybe back to hope and then be rated for how their difficulties make it impossible for them to do better and then maybe even encouraged to ostracize and target others within or outside of their groups as low cows worthy of targeting and derision if not just to take the eat off of themselves the whole thing is as depressingly awful as anything i've talked about on this channel and it's hard because you have to remember that these are the same people with anime avatars in the comment section or on twitter hey 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 you leave the anime avatars alone being the absolute worst to everyone else like i'm not peanut butter wow with the super chat to combat your own ban 
Wow, peanut butter contributing to the possibility of your own ban. <laughs> oh, wow. That's good reverse, reverse psychology. That's pretty good. Not losing track of that paradox. It's a delicate balance between trying to emphasize with the types of people who find themselves in the manosphere, but also recognizing that community, connection, affection, these are genuine human needs that we often underplay how bad it is to not have them and how mm. many of us may not be any better in a different circumstance. There's mm. not having those things. I mean, neurotypicals are also struggling with this as well. Excuse the behavior from these folks. Of course not. But engaging with that part of the discourse should make us think more critically about how we respond to this phenomenon or how quickly we are to engage with low cow activity for some of these guys. Really, it's weird that like, it kind of feels like looking back how it's prime like incel like mm. category, but I mm. never went into it. Like I watched like- Ooh, primed incel category. You just do too, and just never kind of went down that road. Okay, I promise this is not a incel type of point moment, but I mean, I think there's a real thing here of the need for intimacy and need for this is cool, close and physical touch. For me, like being incredibly like 100, 110 percent like vulnerable, like no, yeah, like the fact that I've never been, you know, like held or never been physically intimate with a woman, like that sucks. But I think there is a thing of like wanting that physical intimacy and touch really get around to the touch deprivation is the emotional, mental effects of not having uh, access to um, physical intimacy, access to it, and it's kind of something that very much impacts my kind of self esteem and impacts my um the way i view myself i mean because i've been like dealing with this recently to like where like you know i've just been in a romantic relationship through 24 years of age like at some point because i look at yourself and like shit what's wrong with me you know and that's like you say it's like you know like you sort of think like oh shit am i, am I unlovable or something yeah. like um so like again it starts to kind of border on kind of i don't think it's in solid because there's no like real no like, that's that's a the... violence but like there's a real i think human need for intimacy and one autistic people don't have access to that and if the reaction to the expression of I don't have access to physical intimacy or romantic relationships, this fuck what sucks, is but often so. We're really doing a bad job here. I think a lot of the people who are gravitating towards this toxic, misogynistic, hate filled ideology are doing so in part because the building blocks of like being disenfranchised are there to begin with. And a lot of times we're not even bothering to address that. And some mm -hmm. of the people are like technically an incel, but they're not buying into incel ideology yet. Right. Part of what I'm getting at is- Cause like, it's an ideology, bro. Don't sign up. Don't sign the church flyer. Like being sexless is terrible. Like I feel like there's this like back and forth where we're like, oh, well, it's not that bad. Or like we try and moralize it. And I know we've gone back and forth, and, but, but my stance is that is an essential part of a happy human. Like if you want it, like obviously there's people who are aromantic, et cetera, et cetera. But, with yep. the, but outside of that context, getting to have the kinds of relationships that you want in your life is part of being a thriving human being. I don't agree. I don't agree with that part. I don't agree with that part. I think that's a narrative given to you by uh, by an assumption made from a place of our ancestors coming out of survival. Now that we're moving into a new era of socializing, meaning love marriages, and like not settling, I do think that that's a completely going to shift human dynamic, right? And I don't think it's going to go in that direction. So I you know, I don't think that it's, it's about having like exactly the relationships you want, because I think again, entitlement is not interesting to me, but it's also very human to be entitled. Full stop. But I'm still not done because we still have to return to what makes it possible for these Manosphere figures to do this gross grift upon this population. And that lays at the feet of YouTube and other big tech companies for radicalizing young men. However, emerging research indicates that people aren't really radicalized by extremist content they encounter online. What seems to be more accurate is that. Okay, I feel like I just want to remind Peanut Butter because I do think you are seven. You're the only one who said seven's username correctly with the right capitalization. You defend Steven in my comments, much like seven used to do in a very particular way. All I need you to do now is defend Max and I definitely know that's you. Okay, you give me money in euros. Seven lives in the UK. That makes sense. You donate 99 cents, which was Seven's favorite thing to donate. You also, um, you type like him. Okay. I banned Seven multiple times with multiple usernames on my Discord and on my YouTube chat. And he always came back repeatedly. So I knew you'd come again. You know what I mean? Oh, now you're typing the username without the proper punctuation. Mm. You also share random facts and post 
comments like in paragraphs, which Seven used to do, used to drive me crazy. It's like you'll hear me talking about something and your brain goes, let me go on Wikipedia and copy and paste a ton of paragraphs into Brittany's chat. Seven used to love to do that. You're the only one who does that in the same capacity that he does because it's his part of his like autism. Yep, I said what I said. Okay. And then um, there was something else that maybe was making me, oh, you said your dad died. Seven's dad is dead. <laughs> Sad. But also what are the coincidences? Now I just need to say something like I live with my mom and now I definitely know it's you. Okay. Um, I also heard Seven was going around in other discords talking shit about me and telling other YouTubers that he was upset that I kicked him out of my discord. Do you think it was maybe because you violated terms of service? Oh, and then Seven literally said, um, I didn't do that. Brittany lied about that, but we had screenshots. That's why you were banned. And then you tried multiple times to get around the bans, which is a consent violation, right? So are you doing it again? And then I feel like if you weren't seven, you would be talking differently. Peanut Butter says, I'd ban a person who's on YouTube with the name seven, the narcissistic abuser lurker. Also, no one said the N-word, but you brought it up. And that's one of the accusations against seven. Nobody else called you that. Why'd you bring it up? And Discord says, Brittany's listening to this like she's solving a crime. I am. It's been boggling my brain for weeks because I'm like, okay, I know I'm neurodivergent, girl. I follow patterns. I know shit. Okay. So with all of this said, peanut butter, I'm going to ban you. <laughs> I'm going to ban you. I'm pretty sure you're seven. Okay. I'm almost positive. Because if you weren't seven, you would talk like yourself. Everybody in this chat, I know how people talk. I almost want to say that if some of you changed your usernames and came in with different names, after a while, I'd be like, are you this person? But you can't do it. C7 is trying to, mm, you can't do it. But I know how people talk because I pay attention and it's interesting to my brain. And you talk just like him. Private and guest investigator Simon, I'm just trying to protect my community and my sense of like peace. Okay. And genuinely, with peace and love, seven disturbs my peace. And peanut butter, you remind me too much, too much of it. Brittany, do you get the benefits of your disability? I don't know what you mean. I don't know what that means, elf. I'm going to test it out. Don't try, Yaya. You're just going to say, my kid said hi, and I'm going to know it's you. Nobody changes their usernames on me, okay? I know, memorize your usernames and the way you talk so I can see you as a person and not a username, okay? But peanut butter, this is too much. I noticed the copy and paste fact sharing. That was the giveaway from Colleen. That was a giveaway. Give him one more chance. Make him tell you why the USA is superior to Canada. Oh, yeah. Hey, peanut butter, how do you feel about Canada? Peanut butter says, like I said, a person who has a YouTube video title, Seven, the narcissistic abuser lurking on Discord is gross. Why would you know that? I don't know that. Why would you know that? Why would you know anything about this guy? Whose community are you in? I don't know that video exists. Why do you know? Like somebody has a video going around about you. How do you feel about that? So somebody has a video called Seven is the Narcissistic Abuser. Seven, are you paying attention to FD Signifier's video? Are you the autist that's going to end up in the incel group? You know, I just feel like, look, because you're a ban evader and a consent, like, um, consent violator, like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ban you. You know, it's the YouTube video I just found. Yeah, well, yeah. I searched it from the name Ingrid typed. You still talk like him. You still talk like him. You're not talking like a person who isn't seven. A person who's not seven would be like, Brittany, this is too funny. What are you doing? This literally is not me. Girl, stop. I'm dying. Like, you're not talking unlike seven. You keep talking like seven. And you can't keep violating people's consent. So with peace and love, I am going to ban you. If you're not seven, I'm sorry I made a mistake, but I, I'm i 99% sure you're seven. And I just got it for the sake of myself and my community. I can't. Okay. I really recommend therapy. I think it can really help. Wish you the best, my bro. And just like that, she's gone. Just like that. I'm sorry. It's been bothering me for weeks. Okay. It's been bothering me forever. And I, okay, behind the scenes, he's causing problems 
Okay, in chat, it's problems. Absolutely not. Sorry, guys. Sorry, you can't ban evade and expect me to think that's cute. It's not cute. Don't ban evade. That people tend to have a preset ideological disposition and a limit and will seek out content that reinforces those preset values. So more extreme content mostly just serves as a beacon for more extreme individuals to collect together and deepen their level of radicalization. Our results show that a community of users who predominantly consume content produced by far right channels does exist. And while larger than the corresponding far left community, it is small compared with centrist, left-leaning, or right-leaning communities, and is not increasing in size over the time period of our study. Moreover, we find that on-platform consumption of far-right content correlates highly with off-platform consumption of similar content, that users are roughly twice as likely to arrive at a far-right video from some source other than a previous YouTube video, search, an external website, the homepage, and that far-right videos are no more likely to be viewed towards the end of sessions or in longer sessions. While none of this evidence can rule out the recommendation system as a cause of traffic to far-right content, it is more consistent with users simply having a preference for the content they consume. Facebook can both track what you're doing on platform, but they can also kind of get a sense of like, well, you know, where do you spend your money? What other types of social media platforms do you like to go on? What other types of websites do you- Because everyone fits into categories. Pay attention to yourself. What's your category? Do you enjoy what kind of other content do you like? What age demographic do we think that you are? Even if, you know, on Facebook, you're not looking at manosphere content or something like that, it may end up being recommended to you based on what you do on other parts of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that contributes to, to these things more than people realize. It also influences, you know, recommendation systems and the kind of content that, you know, you, you are preferentially shown by different platforms, um, which can also certainly contribute to the, not necessarily the, the development of these bubbles, but... Um, bubbles! Um, one hour, 17 minutes and 53 seconds. Got a new bubble quote. I'm looking for all the bubble quotes. Okay. I might not write them all down, but I'm almost there. You can stop sending them to me. I'm getting a lot already, but I'm glad. Feeding people into it more efficiently because the content that you engage with on a day-to-day -day level on say Reddit, which does a lot more recommended, or recommended content these days now, may not be political or ministry or whatever, but you might do that on other platforms. And so now Reddit is starting to recommend that you go in that direction because they have this much more comprehensive picture of, of how you engage online than um, you realize at, at the time. Individuals with more extreme beliefs find that community and connect to it. And the social support they find online catalyzes them to adopt even more extreme views. But it's not taking, you know, normal run of the mill centered people and turning them into ultra right wing people. And some people aren't going to like to hear this. Uh, a lot of these people were shitty before they found Andrew Tate. They. I agree with this. I don't know what he's about to say, but this is my theory on mean versus nice. That's my theory. You have a predisposition to end up in an area. You do. And then you have a predisposition to get out faster or not. We're looking for content that reinforces and celebrates their shitty views and behavior. And those who are more moderate might dabble in that shitty content, but typically won't dive deeper into said content. I agree. I 100% agree. Now there's an argument to be made at where the lines are drawn between extreme content and normal content. I agree. Because from what I can glean from the way these social media companies function, most of what we consider the manosphere is normal to them. But this still draws into question a few things. For one, it kind of undermines the whole idea of there being a battle for the future of boys happening here on YouTube and across social media. I think that the nature of being an influencer or a content creator often inflates our audience's image of how powerful and important many of us are. Even your most popular YouTubers are a drop in the bucket in terms of real global influence or specifically political and influence upon structures of power. A while back, Sneeko, who I mentioned earlier, had this embarrassing viral moment where he ran into some of his average fans and they reflected to him the exact type of energy that he had been given off in his content much to his embarrassment after the fact Sneeko got a lot of criticism for this and he defended himself by essentially pointing out the truth that little boys like this have always existed and their mm. behavior isn't his fault and they're raised in homes that say the same shit bro they are raised in homes that say the same shit truthfully because look even though my parents don't like andrew tater the menosphere they're still anti-lgbt they're still anti-feminism they're still anti the left so like of course, their sons are more likely to go in the direction of liking Sneak and Tate after all because of that. Initially, people wanted to reject this, but after thinking about it for a moment, he's right. <laughs> it's the ugly truth, but it's the truth. This doesn't absolve him for his behavior and contribution to the problem. But the lesson to get here is these boys shouldn't have been watching Sneak in the first place. Here's a phrase that I never thought I'd say. Where the fuck were their parents at? Why are mm -hmm. these parents allowing 10, 11-year-old boys to watch Sneak Sneeko. 
The reason for that mm-hmm. is the way boys are socialized. And I often say groomed into misogynistic and shitty behavior that starts locally. The fact that so many people still think boys will be boys is a like solid plan for raising your children. So when those boys make it online, the type of environment and energy and ideology that has been taught to them at home manifests well before they get on YouTube. YouTube agree just recommends them exactly what they were already going to find in the first place. So instead of looking at it as if Andrew Tate is corrupting America's youth, we have to face the fact that so much of our modern culture is already corrupting America's youth. And as a byproduct of this, they find Andrew Tate. If the online and offline domains are ontologically inseparable, then online radicalization becomes a redundant concept. As Gill and colleagues argue, we should not fixate on a simple location of radicalization, but instead need to understand the drives, needs, and forms of behavior that led to the radicalization and attack planning, and why offenders chose that environment rather than purely looking at the affordances that the environment produced. The frame of a binary dichotomy tends to result in the internet being given radicalizing agency, which overlooks other important factors, such as vulnerabilities, stressors, or how online and offline factors combine. Manosphere has a disproportionate amount of autistic boys and men who follow it. The Manosphere clearly targets and captures these boys and the neurotypical boys who are less developed in their understanding of masculinity and exploits their insecurities, capturing them in a negative feedback loop. Social media websites are not doing enough to address this or protect people from the behavior that happens in these spaces. But we have to also be clear that the core problem here is the way these boys are being raised apart from their online environment. What we're seeing right now with the Manosphere is just another example of social dysfunction, which is emblematic of how boys are required to be socialized in a society designed for most people to fail. Where the fear of not being on top isn't just a matter of ego and accolades or impressing all the girls, but literal life and death. In her book, The Bully Society, sociologist Jesse Klein has a chapter discussing the socioeconomic underpinnings of school shootings and explicitly ties it to the difficulties of performing normative masculinity under capitalism. Mm -hmm. The school shooters, for the most part, grew up in the 1980s or later. The rise in school shootings roughly coincides with the Reagan administration's restructuring of the American economic, political, and cultural landscape, a period that glorified unrestrained capitalism and re-emphasized an up-by-your-bootstraps ethos. Reagan promised an America rich with freedom, individualism, and financial reward for those who skillfully met the standard coupled with a lower degree of support for those who did not. Increasingly, success was defined in terms of power, economic attainment, and social status. The same barometers increasingly used at the high school level to assess masculinity. Later in this same chapter, she circles back to the manufactured drive for status among young men and the corporations that take advantage of it. The message adults receive as they battle through the status wars are transmitted wholesale to children and teens. As a part of their strategy to boost sales and profits, corporations have increasingly directed their efforts towards the youth market. In her book, No Logo, Naomi Klein discusses the rise of branding in which companies seek to sell not just products, but also the illusion of status, identity, and lifestyle that go along with them. Like an ideology associated with the product. That's what's so fascinating about marketing to me. It's like an association with an ideology. If you wear this type of clothing, it says something about you. You must think like this. If you eat this kind of food, oh, you must be this. Like it is true. We fall into categories and we signal to one another constantly with how we spend our money. It's very interesting. Like companies look at us and know we want to be a part of the in-group by signaling the right things. And so they market even to our own ideologies, which is so interesting because to be honest, even I do that. I say, okay, what kind of an audience do I want to have? Right? And then I try to bring out that version of myself that's more likely to attract that audience. If I was going for a different audience, I would find the version of myself, like the things I'm already into, that kind of coincide with that particular audience, right? So it's kind of one of those things where even I, as a business person, I'm like, okay, what kind of a clientele do I want? What kind of callers do I want to encourage to call me? What kind of people do I want in my, you know, collab DMs? And it's like, okay, so I'm like, how do I do that? And it's really for me because I want to be able to come to work and not, you know, fake it. But also, I don't need to show all of myself, just the part of myself that I think would bring in the best audience to like make coming to work a beautiful thing. I don't want to come to work and come to work to like a very grumpy, like adversarial audience. In my early 20s, I had a very adversarial audience. It was mostly the atheist bubble audience. And it was so stressful coming to work every day and fighting with people. There was a time when it was fun. But then I was like, hey, I just want to come to work and like treat people like people. And it was not easy, you know, and I was already working two jobs at the same time and trying to do all these things. And I was already stressed or no, one other job at the same time. And I was stressed. So I was already like, oh, my gosh. So I realized that, too, as I have rebuilt my audiences over and over again. I think this is by far the best audience I've ever had. 
It is the most thoughtful and caring audience. And they generally mean very well for people, which I appreciate, you know? Although the power of the brand now extends to all age groups, it is most prevalent among teenagers. The companies believed, rightfully as it turned out, that youth with their fragile identities and susceptibility to peer pressure would do anything to possess the right brands. And yeah, this is where the real power of the Manosphere exists. It's not in their rhetoric or ideas. It doesn't take much to look at Manosphere content and see that the vast majority of them aren't even talented. The Manosphere and reactionary thought in general has a built-in advantage based solely on the way society functions. When those 12 year- I will, I'll, I'll say this out loud, and this is just me trying to be more balanced and nuanced. Um, actually, if you go back, okay, so just, just to be clear, um, Myron is very successful in business and real estate. Tate is a professional, um, fighter. So he, credit where credit's due. Justin Waller run and ran a very successful construction company in which he made his wealth. Um, Fresh is an idiot and Sneeko is an idiot, but Sneeko is a very creative and very popular YouTuber who had a lot of success. Um, and Fresh, I have no idea what Fresh does. I don't think anyone does. So, but Sneeko was a very talented and very successful YouTuber before he went red pill. So just a reminder, all of these men actually do have talents and, and, and credibility to their names outside of YouTube. They just use YouTube to push the rhetoric. So if they didn't have the rhetoric associated, I think all of them would be considered pretty successful. So I just I just want to say that I think that's more than fair. And I only know because I deep dive into this bubble all day. And so I know things about like their jobs and stuff. So, you know, where credit was where credit is due. And reactionary thought in general has a built in advantage based solely on the way society functions. When those 12 year old boys first Google how to talk to girls, everything about the world as they've understood it to that point is grooming them for an Andrew Tate. It's not grooming them for me. Andrew Tate is closer to the image of masculinity that is championed in our culture. It's not hard for him to amass followers. Me, I got to make two hour. Ari right, says Tate gained most of his wealth trafficking women. Right. But before he was a trafficker, he was a successful uh, person in sports. And so I think they're, like that's where I'm going to give him credit. I'm not going to give him credit for anything else he did. Right. Long YouTube videos slowly breaking down piece by piece why that shit is wrong. Just to say maybe you shouldn't hate women and say they're not able to vote and that will help you improve your desirability. Yeah, just a little bit. You got like a little bit. Unless you want to date Pearl. You notice how Pearl doesn't want to date any of these men and these men don't want to date Pearl? Hmm. Hmm. That's how hard it is to do this shit. But if I collected a bunch of OnlyFans models and got up here yelling and shouting ridiculous inflammatory things, yeah, that would suck in 12 year olds. And that's why this content is designed the way it's designed. That's why Sneeko's fans are 11 years old and not 30. And that's why YouTube and TikTok and Twitter all but openly court this type of content and turn a blind eye to the problem of what's happening. And even the hand wringing about those neuroatypical boys being caught up in the manosphere is a red herring once you take this into consideration. It's not the neuroatypicalness that they deal with. It's the hegemonic drive that they have to imagine themselves as normal alpha males that pulls them in. They have that insecurity. And then here's the manosphere guy with their online course about being financially independent or learning about Bitcoin. That is the part where Tate scammed his way into money. Absolutely. He was a he was a kickboxer. That's how he got out of poverty after his dad ditched him and wasn't a father. So his father ditched the family to be a chess player. And so the single mom raised the boys in um, an L word in the UK. Lockton, Levin, where's the L, the L word? Okay. So they were raised in like poor. And then to get out of poor, they went into sports and he did kickboxing professionally. Then he did scamming, sex trafficking women, selling courses on how to sex traffic women. And that's how he made his money. And now he's where he's at. So, you know, just a reminder that Tate's father was a loser dad who ditched his kids and didn't raise them so he could be a professional chess player. Fine. Haley and Luton, Luton. Thank you, Marty. Luton. Um, Haley and says, I'm curious what you think Pearl's level is. Is she a true grifter 2A or just a luck 2BC? I mean, I think lots of people could try to grift no matter their level. But the question is, is she a 2C? What kind of grifter? So is she a 2A grifter or 2BC grifter? Does she have an ideology that allows her to grift? Or is she just like, nothing matters. I'm going to do this. I don't know. I do not know. And I, I'm very confused by it. Her family, friends, ex-best friends say like this was not how she was growing up. I don't know if her family would like be happy about this. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I want to say 
I want to say there's a possibility she's just an incredibly damaged pick me woman who's been insecure her whole life and is playing a game with boys. She's never going to win because they're never going to pick her. And so I'd say she could be a, a 2B with an with a with a value system that says she can grift or she might be a 2A who's like deeply insecure as a woman. I, I just don't know. Hannah says, Brittany, is Pearl someone you'd like to talk on stream or is she one of those public figures that wouldn't be worth platforming? Oh, no, I'd love to give Pearl the cupcake. I would love to give Pearl the cupcake, but I just don't think she cares. Like, I think she's too busy. She does not care what women think. She doesn't care what anyone thinks but these men and these men, like, definitely don't care what she thinks. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Heck says he didn't have a ton of money from kickboxing and got into starting scams to make his riches but stopped after fighting. And he was on Big Brother. I forgot he was on the Big Brother reality show. They kicked him off because he had a grape charge, right, in the UK. Isn't that why he had to leave Big Brother or did I misremember? Because he's had grape charges or grape uh, or warrant arrests. I forget the legal terms, you know, out for his arrest. I can't remember, but he was on Big Brother. And I forget, I forget if that's why they had to get him off the show. The art of seduction and maybe at best the diet and workout plan. But that's not something that starts on your For You page. That's something that literally starts in the home and the way we raise and socialize boys. So what can be done about this? Ooh. First and foremost, stop passively raising your sons. Stop yes. telling your sons not to cry. Stop ignoring their emotional needs yes. and development. Stop believing boys will be boys. Have complex, challenging conversations with them about mm. what they watch and the media they consume. Invest in their emotional development. Treat them like humans instead of future soldiers or breadwinners. Like, True. if you raise boys and you're around other people who raise boys there's this hegemonically driven thing where you can tell everyone's fear is raising a weak man mm. and wow i empathize with that because that's still a fear i have mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of people haven't deconstructed how that actually works and what weak men really look like hint hint it's sneeko <laughs> oh i don't know if people get that I, if, I think if people understand and that's the bummer i i do think sneeko is a weak man for sure. I mean, he's a kid to me, right? But he's not a man yet. He hasn't even started to be a man, right? Men have different, just like women. Have, look, look at FD Signifier next to Sneeko. Obviously, one is a man and one isn't. To be fair, FD Signifier is much older and has lived a life and is a father. So like Sneeko might be an adult, but he's not a man yet. But he's still a man. But he's not a man yet. You also have to age into being a man. You know, I didn't feel like a woman until I was 27. And I really didn't feel like a woman until I was 30. And I didn't even feel like a real woman until really now. Like I now am starting to feel like a grown up, like a real adult in a very particular way. I'm like, oh, I'm like a woman. I'm like a grown up, you know? It's very different. Even though I've worked my whole life, I've paid my own rent. I've done all that shit. I just, it's different. So, and Sneeko's ADHD and neuro, uh, neurodivergent. So I don't know if FD knows that, but they're showing studies or at least running articles saying that um, neurodivergents are developing a little slower. So, I mean, Sneeko's still not even cooked yet. He's not even cooked, you know? Sage says man-child. Yes, he's a man-child. Exactly. And man-baby, man-child, you can be 70 years old. You can be 70 years old and be a man-child. Let's see if Sneeko outgrows his child, child, you know? Let's see. Understood what weakness really looked like in men. Oh, man, things would be so much fucking better. Who do you think will win in the fight between Sneeko and Foreman? Me. I'm going to win. Who has more discipline? Who has a wife and a kid? No, I'm not I feel like Mooncat and I could both take Sneeko easily. I bet you couldn't even take two girls. I'll put Foreman out there to challenge Sneeko to a fight. It's more work to... I'll do it. I'll be that man. I'll be that man. Raise a little boy to be shitty than to raise a little boy to be a nice kid. Like, most children come out wanting to be nice oh. little kids babies unless they have a psychological thing or a uniqueness to them like neurodivergency which causes like uh like uh, antisocial personality disorder or other things yes i agree most kids do and i do think sneeko from my understanding was raised by a good family but i think he's deviated very strongly from that family you know as most kids do like i said my dad's a really good person he did not raise my brothers to like tate but here we are here we are toddlers most of them are really fucking nice. You have to train boys to be shitty.
And most people are training boys to be shitty because that's what they think real manhood looks like. That is literally how Andrew Tate's father raised him. Beyond that though, for other parts of this machine, we also need to start putting more pressure on these social media companies. They will change if it starts affecting their bottom line. I know multiple female creators who have had protracted harassment campaigns by anti-SJW manager creators in the same way that women were having 10 years ago. And if YouTube is smart enough, they won't wait for another tragedy to happen before they make changes. Quick editor's note here to introduce the fact that Jordan is gonna bring up something called Section 30 which explains oh. a significant reason why YouTube and other social media platforms do not do heavier moderation of the type of content that's on their platform. Section 230 um, essentially makes platforms not responsible for the content that they host because Facebook has run into this issue a million times. When you start making quote unquote editorial decisions about the content that appears on your platform, you start to become responsible or you can um, mm. become responsible. This is typically a legal thing. So like someone would have to like sue you for it and it would have to be deemed in court that you are, but you can become responsible for all of the content on your platform, um, which like no social media platform wants because it would be the death knell of that platform. So yeah, this kind of shows us, you know, why it's going to be down to putting the pressure on the companies from a monetary standpoint. The apocalypse happened because the overall attitudes towards YouTube. And no, Real Smith said FD is on one. Kids need to learn not to be psychopathic narcissists. Absolutely not. I've worked in childcare most of my life. I did child development in college, did not graduate, did not finish college, did not even try to do more than a year. But like, no, no, no. Humans are not little, they're not born little psychopathic narcissists. That's something people say. But like inherently, like kids are not like that way. That's not accurate. I don't think they need to be taught not to be. I think they need to be encouraged to like, f again, humans are like little animals. So like even left neutrally, they could come out neutral. They don't need to be taught something. They need to be guided or have an environment that naturally guides it to like bring out the best or worst or indifferent. But they can be also neutral. You know what I mean? They're not automatically psychopathic narcissists. That's like you're putting something on them that's not true, you know? Cosmic says we're raising boys to be shitty, but also Brittany's dad was nice and her brother still fell into the Andrew Tate bubble. Well, yeah, because he by, he had 10 kids. And by the time it got to the youngest kids, he wasn't as active in like watching their media. Like he knows who Andrew Tate is now, but it's not like he was on the Internet watching Andrew Tate content thinking his kids were watching it. Once he once he had a Gen Z kid, those Gen Z kids. um they were doing their own stuff. It wasn't like they were modern. Keep in mind, parents get tired. The oldest kids get the roughest part of the parents, which is what I got. Then the middle kids get the like more chill parents. And then the younger kids get basically no parenting. My family is not exempt from this. You literally see the difference between the middle kids, the older kids and the younger kids. There's like huge difference in parenting styles because your parents are aging with you. My parents were 30 when they had me and their youngest just graduated high school a few years ago and they're 65. Like, we did not have the same childhoods. We had completely different childhoods. So like my youngest brother was never even homeschooled and I was homeschooled till I was 15. Totally different parents. So yeah, my parents raised me different than they raised my little brother just because they were different people at the time. That's just how it goes. That's why like, parenting is complicated. It gotten really negative and people that were spending money wanted certain quality assurances and sadly that is kind And by the way, most of my brothers didn't fall into the Andrew Tate bubble. It's just the Gen Zers are more susceptible. And of what will need to happen in order to fix the problem of this type of content. That said, the sad reality again is that YouTube is already a thousand times better than TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. So they need to feel the pressure too. I predicted months ago that when suburban moms found out about Andrew Tate, that this would lead to action. And not long after I said that it happened and then suddenly he was the platform. I don't know which one of y'all has access to all the white moms in the suburbs. I know a few of you do. <laughs> Y'all need to go ahead and activate that population or whatever population you can to get some things going. Get, can we get Nancy Hilarious. Reagan back in the streets? Hilarious. Just for a second. Throw dope Nancy Reagan. Let's go. If you have little brothers, nephews, cousins, make sure their parents are aware of this stuff early. Like not 12, 13 when they're going through puberty as they're seven, eight, and nine. Please inform the parents of your nephews and cousins what's happening in our online media so that they start addressing it now. And this is also why I don't think people like myself should stop making this type of anti management content, despite any criticism that I may have voiced here. Because for one, we're kind of the canaries in the coal mine. We know what's happening well before it starts reaching out into the greater society. And we can set up case studies and information on what the problem is to point people to when they're actually ready to address it. 
Also, let's be real. One, we're fucking entertaining. We're good at what we do. But two, the audience watches us because it's useful to them to get that release valve, to get that reminder that not everyone is on this bullshit, especially for other men like myself who fit the description of Manosphere Guy online, but are obviously saying something very different. It's valuable and important for them to hear and perceive opposing voices. It's a lot of pressure and you all shouldn't hold us up on a pedestal for pointing this stuff out, but it's still a valuable role to be fulfilled. So let's please continue to go at their heads and collect your coins in the process. Lastly, I do still want to offer something for those being milked in this equation, the actual manosphere consumers and those of you who are actually just trying to figure some things out as young men. I will try to do better than in my last video where I basically just said, be yourself, although, that's still really good fucking advice. First off, again, I want to remind you that if you're watching Manosphere content, its goal is to trap you in a negative feedback loop. True. As soon as you start seeing woman gets owned videos coming out of your favorite creator, understand that is exactly what they're doing. It recognizes your insecurities and vulnerabilities and feeds into it. But I also understand that it's not just about breaking the loop. What we're also talking about is breaking with a community. That's something that, you know, if I do a future video, I'll deal with more that needs to be more studied because the re reality is that the Manosphere has its message boards and followings because that's where these mm. people who have been disaffected by society collect together and connect with each other. And a lot of them, the key thing that keeps them in is the fear of being disconnected. If there's one thing that I do think the left could do better on, it's in this regard that if we're serious about trying to address these issues, mm. we probably need to support the creation of more spaces for some of these folks looking to retreat away from it. Now, the challenge is you can't go from your white supremacist incel message board into the bread tube Reddit. Like right. that's Ooh. that should not happen. Not, you will not end up happen. not having a good time and the people that receive you there mm. will not appreciate it. He's describing the bubbles so perfectly. You're probably radioactive and you're going to risk re-traumatizing and triggering other people. And much like radioactivity, it may take a bit for certain bad habits and ideologies to go away. So there needs to be more in-between spaces. That's something that Innuendo Studio said in the early Manosphere video that I don't know if I cut. If I didn't cut, it'll go right here. But basically he was like, we need to create like a midpoint between here, we've arrived at good politics, which also isn't true, but whatever. And the government should assign every virgin a girlfriend that's not allowed to vote. You shouldn't really be jumping like, that's a yeah. big gap to fill. Being in communities mm -hmm. both on and offline, but definitely offline, allows for more opportunities to fight off loneliness and develop meaningful bonds and build confidence. And if you're lucky, there may be women in the community. And if you act like you have some sense, there may even be romantic opportunity. That shouldn't be why you go. Consider that like bonus DLC, right? Is that is that what the kids say? Bonus points if you find things offline to do, but like one last piece of data I found is that one of the least likely places for people to encounter the manosphere is from an actual person in real life, like a peer or friend or family member. This stuff doesn't really exist outside of online spaces. So if you can find space for yourself offline, which I know isn't easy and not mm. possible for everyone, but if you can, you're probably gonna be more likely to make progress. So that's my loving and gentle parenting type advice. And now here's Mac and Murphy with like some really explicit, specific stuff that's driven by research and data that. Okay, hold up. Legend, thank you so much for the super just says, I'm not saying he's wrong, but it's conjunctive. Um, conjunctive. Most women are more attracted to a tough guy than the cry guy. So there's a little romantic reward for them if we raise our sons to being softer. In a population of 8 billion people globally, you've referenced two categories of men. You mentioned basically, let's call it the binary. Let's say the tough guy and the cry guy are the binary. What about every other type of guy? What about the guy who's aware of his feelings but doesn't whine? Is the cry guy somebody who whines and the tough guy is somebody who grapes you? Because if the whine guy is the opposite of the tough guy, that means they're both bad. The tough guy is not the automatically good guy. Women being attracted to tough men who will disrespect their boundaries and break their consent is not good. Women who are attracted to men who whine and, uh, you know, throw and burden them with their feelings are not good. These binaries are the bad parts of society that are very human and within nature, but they're not good. I would recommend going somewhere in the middle. OK, I would not recommend the tough guy who's going to violate the fuck out of your consent. And I would not violate the whiny guy who's also going to violate your consent by dishing all of their feelings onto you and expecting you just to take care of them because you're their mom. Okay? What about the women who say they want it? Cool. I hope they all toxically marry each other and leave the rest of us alone. I don't recommend being in toxic relationships, but you are allowed to consent to being in your toxic relationship. I don't recommend being in a toxic relationship. You are allowed to consent to being in your toxic relationship. We see it on YouTube all the time. Don't date Sneeko. And yet, there are going to be women who want to save him and date him. Okay? Don't date toxic men. 
is my recommendation. Don't take toxic women is my recommendation. They will still do it. So let them all date each other until they get out of that cycle, if they ever do. And everyone else who says they want a healthy relationship should not date the extremes of the bad and should go for people who are better adjusted. Right? Because again, I love this super chat. I appreciate it so much. But if you're saying the only two options are the tough guy versus the cry guy, those not, that's not, men are not a monolith. You know? Right? I love a man who cries. I love a man in his emotions. I love a man who's tough. I want both. But they come in the form, they come in different forms. Having a person that cries is beautiful. I cry all the time. My husband's in his feelings. We know how to have responsible feelings. We also are not vampires. We don't burden each other with our feelings. We don't abuse each other because we're sad or mad or in our feelings. We are not like toxic in those directions. But if you find yourself being toxic in those directions, that's not good. You know, it's not good. So again, like trolling says, guys, dudes who cry are red flags. Yeah, I just disagree. I think, you know, anything could be a red flag to you if that's your belief. I just don't think men who cry, period, are a red flag. I don't think men who are tough are a red flag. I think men who are only tough and refuse to show their emotions are a red flag. I think men who are too in their emotions and are never like stoic are a red flag. We want balance. You know what I mean? But if you want to be toxic, date toxic, girl. I'm not your mom. I'm not here to tell you to do otherwise. Right? But also... That is what Red Pill is advocating for. They're advocating for toxic relationships. And I don't think you should date, I don't think you should be in a toxic relationship personally. So. That, you know, should be helpful as well. So I was going to And have, I do think a majority of people end up in toxic or settled relationships. So what are you gonna do? Mac and Murphy give us some, you know, strong tips on improving your romantic outlook, but uh, he dropped too many bars. He, he had way too much good stuff that I didn't want to kind of cut short here in this video. So you can find the interview that I have with him on a signified podcast, which is a separate nice. channel that I made a little while ago. I only have three episodes of the podcast out. This will be the fourth or fifth, depending on what. Is that his wife? This comes out. Who is this? Who's this woman? Is that his wife? And you. Yeah. You can get a lot of that stuff, plus a lot. Am I crazy? Does she look like Kiki Palmer? Is that his wife? She's beautiful. She looks literally like Kiki Palmer. I'm dying. Is that his? Am I wrong? I just don't, I don't know his personal life. I don't know who, who is this woman? She looks like Kiki Palmer. I love Kiki. I love her. More from that conversation from there. You should also follow Mac and Murphy on TikTok and wherever else he is. I think he does a really solid job of getting into this topic. If you are not interested in the politics, if you just want to find out real research around dating and romance and intimacy, I uh, highly advise checking him out. All this said, I also want to be honest. What I am presenting here is a formality. It's mm. for those in the comment section that say, why don't you present your solutions? This is not secret information that will perfectly fix the problems in your personal life. That is the difference, the real difference between the left not having anything to offer men. We just don't want to fucking lie to y'all, right? The reality- uh, and, Unless they do want to, but I, I believe FD, I do. I, I'd have, I, I've dealt with a lot of fucking leftist uh, essayists and they are willing to lie to you. But I think FD might be a real one, bro. I feel it. I feel it in my intuition. He He's a real one. I do. I'm going to I'm going to go in good faith. I feel like he's treated this community well. He's been good with his content. You might disagree with it. And I definitely I've definitely been critical. But this video was fucking on point. I really I think he tackled the bubble really good. Is that nothing that I've said is a surefire solution to the challenges that you feel like you're facing. In fact, it's more likely that as you try whatever I've just said or whatever someone else you pull from this video says that you will fail multiple times and probably have to try over and over and over again. And even then, you're not guaranteed anything better. That's reality. But understand that's always been reality for everyone. Even with every tool you think you need or are missing to access your goals, you will always be facing that uncertainty. The only thing I can say with certainty is that the situation you may currently find yourself in that has you consuming this type of content definitely will not help you. It True. is a death cult. It is only going to make things worse. And that's the funny thing about the whole, the left doesn't have anything to offer men because it insinuates that the manosphere does. Mind you, again, niggas over here are married and having relationships. Like we are not falling in the manosphere because we don't need that shit, right? Meanwhile, half the people on that side of the equation 
don't have the things they tell you mm -hmm. they'll help you get. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's not how those things mm -hmm. work. I said this in some video, but it's not like leveling up, right? You're not going to kill enough slimes and get enough XP points to level up to be viable to have a relationship and a girlfriend. You cannot do it. It's a random encounter, right? Right, right. But even then, this isn't really what the left should be coming in for you. If mm. you are looking to improve your life and finding ways- Because having a relationship is not the end all be all. ...ways to better perform traditional masculinity. There are actually really good other types of content that don't have as much of a political slant that you could be looking for, but you probably haven't found because you're kind of shitty. But, you know, I'm not going to argue with you about here. I've mentioned before guys like Jason Wilson, and there's mm -hmm. like the Art of Manliness podcast. Mm -hmm. Shout out to the Waving Red Flag guys who are smaller podcasts that I featured mm -hmm. in this video, and I've talked mm -hmm. a couple of times. There's plenty of stuff there for you, but you have to have the discernment. To there are so many podcasts for men that are not even close to the red pill, like fla even Flagrant, which is more centrist and funny and less PC. They're married. They have families. Andrew Schultz just had a daughter. Like, you don't have to go red pill. You can be wealthy men who are well-adjusted, who have relationships with women that they actually like spending time with and not be a progressive. Like, they're very, they're good men. To recognize the difference between people actually concerned with improving the challenges and needs of men and those looking to exploit you by getting you into rage cycles aimed at yep. women. Understand that the algorithm is aware of which thing you are more inclined to do. Are you trying to upgrade your masculinity or are you pissed that a girl called you ugly? Which mm. everything is most prominent in your psyche, the algorithm will figure it out and treat you accordingly. So before you start searching for anything, you might wanna start doing some self-searching away from the internet. But that's way above my pay grade, even though the manuscript content will get me paid. Speaking of which, let's also talk about today's sponsor. So this video was one of my heavier undertakings. I started working on it probably last fall, setting up Damn. interviews, a lot of research, writing and rewriting, all while still writing, filming, and collaborating with editors on other main channel FD Signifier content, Ooh. plus two or three videos a month on the Signify B-Size commentary channel, and most recently, a Signify podcast. So this video was a labor of love, but very, very much a labor. However, I'm confident that it's going to be successful, and in the off chance that it flops, link, despite guys. all of my efforts, that will be okay, because I have the support of the folks at Nebula. Nebula is an independent streaming the service created by YouTubers like myself, where we can have a place for creators to work the way we want to work and make the types of content we want to make without the persistent pressures that YouTube puts upon us. As I speak to in this video, YouTube and other social media platforms work off computer algorithms and machine learning driven recommendation systems. And there are so many ways that- Okay, this was really, really good. Shout out to the sponsor, uh, Nebula. Shout out to the video. I linked it in the chat. I liked it. I'm obviously subscribed. I was unsubscribed from FD Signifier and I don't know the why YouTube does this to me. I was wondering, I was like, why haven't I seen FD post? And literally YouTube unsubscribes me from people and it pisses me off. Like, that's the one complaint I have about YouTube. Peace and love to YouTube. They need to stop unsubscribing people from people. And literally, like, pets, oh, because then I forget people exist. And my brain, like, I just, like, all these months will go by. And I'm like, wait, where did they, you know, anyways. Okay. Ultimately, we all live in bubbles and we all live in ecosystems. And like FD said, if you find yourself surrounded by a type of person, recognize there's 8 billion people on the planet and you might just need to turn left. Do something different. Every, like, humans are humans everywhere. But not all humans are in the same categories, okay? So if you notice you're around toxic people and they're horrible and they're treating you badly and you keep picking toxic after toxic after toxic after toxic, something has to look in the mirror. I know it's hard to say out loud, but truthfully, and I mean this with like all of my heart, there's no way as a healthy person now I could end up in a toxic relationship um, long term. I would figure it out. But I was so toxic in my 20s, I would let toxic people run me over, lie to me. I'd get, I'd make excuses for them. You would do all these things. Look at what happened in chat earlier. A commenter and a user who has evaded my blocks, broken my consent, talked shit behind closed doors, spread rumors about me, tried to start fights with other YouTubers and me between us. Got told in the chat like, oh, he has a good heart. No offense to the person who wrote that. The person who violates consent multiple times over and over and over again has a good heart. I don't even know what that means. Maybe. I don't know. But like in the past, I would have let that slide. And I know you guys see me let you see me being lenient on people. I'm trying to meet people where they're at. But this person has been warned, has tried to go around ban evasion. I'm pretty I'm 99 percent sure it was them because they didn't even try to like in any way pretend it wasn't right. I can meet them where they're at. They're in their 50s. They're old enough. They should know better. 
or at least they're older than 45. I don't remember, but they're old. Like you should know better. And if not, too bad. Learn better. I'll block you. You'll figure it out. And by the way, I've blocked them before, so they didn't learn the lesson. They'll probably come back. It's what it is. Okay? So ultimately, meet people where they're at, but especially meet yourself where you're at, but call yourself out. Call yourself out. Why do I keep coming back to Britney's stream and violating her consent over and over again? What is wrong with me? Why do I keep doing this in every community I'm in? Why do I stand out? Why am I the problem? It's you, bro. Why are all the people I date, why are they horrible to me? Why don't they treat me right? Why aren't, look at yourself, you're the common denominator. Okay? Again, peace and love. But I'm open with boundaries and this is a boundary. Okay? Have it with yourself. Have a boundary with yourself. Don't let you trap you in bad loops. Don't let you put you in bad situations. If you're you are your friend, don't let your friend drag you into bad relationships. You're the friend. Don't let you drag you into bad relationships. But if you find yourself in one, recognize how you got there. Often we date because we see people like parts of people in ourselves. Often we're compassionate, like Abba was saying earlier, because we see parts of ourselves in other people. Usually we connect with cultures around because we see parts of ourselves in them. If you're hanging around toxic people, what part of you are you seeing in them? In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Done.